Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, if, if you would uh, indulge me, thank you for bringing it to my attention. On behalf of the chair, uh, we wanted to have a moment of silence for tax collector Helen Burns. Helen Burns, if we can take a moment. All right. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, can you hear us okay? Um, is he frozen or does he have us on mute maybe? Or? He's frozen. Okay. Yeah, we'll just keep, keep rolling here. As soon as he gets caught up, we'll, we'll bring him back in. So can we have a uh, team member? I don't know if it's going to be Dulce. Is Dulce here? No? Um, Jennifer, do you want to go over the uh, Zoom? Rules and the uh, governor's order, please. Um, Mike, Mike, please. <clears throat> if you are accessing Zoom from the public and would like to make a public comment, please press star nine or raise your hand icon when prompted to make a comment. When you've been unmuted, if you could please state your name and you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to presentations and recognitions. No. CAO? There's no. None? Okay. Uh, can I get a, um, a motion for a certificate of potion? Three. Second. What's the pleasure of the board? How do you all, how do you all vote? Let's, let's yeah. use plain language, yes? Any, anybody else? Can you, can you guys hear us on the, on the uh, video chat? Go ahead. Uh, I can. Um, is the volume the, the best you can do right there? Yeah, Supervisor Patello, can try, try that. Can you hear us better now? Um, yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay, so um, we're going to work on our technology a little bit before we keep moving along here. Um, can we get a sound check from Supervisor Patello? Go ahead. You could hear me, and I think we uh, need to hear you a little bit better. Okay. Um, Super, Supervisor Botello, how do you hear me now? That's better than okay. a minute ago. We're going to have to get real close to our mics, it sounds like, today. Um, Supervisor Hernandez, go ahead and do a mic check. And Anthony, why don't you let us know if you can hear everybody, okay? Because Jaime, Jaime dropped off. Hello, everybody. You, can you hear Peter okay, Anthony? Go ahead. I just got a text from a constituent that said they hear loud and clear. Okay. Maybe there's something on your end, Anthony, possibly your volume or something else going on there. All right. Anthony, we're not hearing you at all. You might have locked up again. Maybe there's a, uh, we had some freezing here earlier this morning. Maybe there's a um, kind of a countywide thing going on. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep moving, uh, Anthony, and maybe perhaps you can call in. We okay. have three of us here. All right. You calling the, you know, we're going to take a, a, a five minute recess to try to get these tech technical issues worked out because um, it's not fair to anybody if people can't hear us. We'll be, we'll be right back.
Um, Mr. Chair, we are at. Uh, we made it through that. We made it through presentations and proc proclamations. Okay. And now uh, you can take over there. We're okay. At so we're at public comments now. Yes, sir. Or presentation. Public comment. I'm sorry. I apologize. Where, where, where are we at? Public comment, sir. Um. Thank you. All right. Public comment section. This is an opportunity to address the board on issues. Non, not in the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors. Do we have any speaker cards? We do. Carmen Garcia. Good morning, board. Good morning. My name is Herman Garcia, and I'm the founding president <laughs> of CHEER, Coastal Habitat Education Environmental Restoration. Uh, I'm here this morning to give you a quick briefing of the history that we made in San Benito County uh, this past month. And I think most of you probably seen it in the newspapers and on television in newscast. Here's an article in the freelance, another one in the dispatch on the return of steelhead trout to San Benito County and the San Benito River. This is historical, hasn't happened over 75 years. And this is information provided by us by our main partner, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I think you all received a cheer newsletter. 18 months ago, we started what we call habitat reclamation on the San Benito River. If you look at the pictures Ooh, on the inside of all the garbage that we pulled out of there, it was record amounts of garbage this year. Um, on the centerfold, you'll see all the people that were involved, businesses, Gavilan College, school kids, and hundreds of volunteers were involved in this effort. And towards page six and seven on uh, the granite rock property on the San Benito River. In the month of October, we took out 14 cars and pickups, one massive RV, and two ski boats out of the river channel. Uh, and 1,220 tires were taken out last year. So these efforts, uh, were conducted on two properties, the Bettable pro uh, Project property down at the confluence of the in, San Benito and the Pajaro, the and then further upstream on the Granite Rock property. So as a result of those reclamation efforts, uh, we discovered this year that steelhead actually came into the system where they would ignore it before because of all the toxins and pollutants coming into the pajaro they just keep going but because of the reclamation the cleanup they came scooting right in and they spawned in december uh thank you sir thank you, can sir. we see the video real quick we're gonna have to move on because of three minutes. thank you sir perhaps later on we can do that yeah, you guys can see it. We'll we have a minute 30 video. We'll look to at show it. We'll look at I promise you, I'll look at it. it. Thank you, sir. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Next speaker. Salinas. Yes, madam. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, Elias Salinas, I'd like to, I'm coming up here to say thank you to the uh, San Benito County Sheriff's Department and the Ag Commissioner's Office for eradicating the, uh, the illegal um, unlicensed uh, marijuana uh, that, uh, facility down in South County. 
and I truly appreciate it. The people in the legal industry really appreciate this. Uh, there's many more out there, and we know that the uh, San Benito County Sheriff's Department is very busy. Uh, there limit, are limited resources and manpower, but um, it's truly appreciated, and I just wanted to put it out to the, uh, in front of the Board of Supervisors um, to give them a kudos for the great job that was done, and hopefully that there will be some more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Wayne, if you could please state your name. Hi, uh, good morning, God. My name is uh, Wayne Norton, and I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about um, an impact of COVID-19 that's made uh, worse by the lack of broadband access in the county. You know, uh, school starting in a couple of weeks and distance learning will be the predominant teaching method, but we risk uh, losing a large segment of our student population because we know that they do not have access uh, to broadband uh, regardless of the device, they just don't have connectivity. Um, and we also know that lack of broadband in the county is a, is a serious problem for other populations, including older adults, especially those who are isolated and in rural areas. Without connectivity to the broadband, uh, to broadband, they cannot uh, take part in telemedicine and other services that reduce their um, isolation. Um, I uh, want to urge the uh, board to take a look at CARES funding and see if there's a way that you can use CARES funding to expand uh, broadband connectivity um, throughout the county to all the reaches of the county, uh, especially because of the impact of COVID-19. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other speaker? How do we sign up for public comment? If you could please state your name. You have been unmuted. Hi, this is Michelle from Salon 218. Um, we opened with guidelines into our salon, masks, distancing, sanitation, and servicing less than normal amounts of customers. We followed the guidelines of our county health department set up for us and the governor of California. And if this is not enough, we went over the top trying to do our part as custom, keeping our customers safe. In, a, in our salon alone, for the first month, we covered all of our guests. We called them the night before and asked them a series of COVID questions. Michelle, but right on, Michelle I'm sorry. Um, we have an item to discuss and there'll be a golden opportunity for you to, and I'll give you a full three minutes at the item number, number 33 okay. when that comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Madonna, if you could please state your name. Hi, this is Adana, resident yes. of San Benito County. Um, first of all, Henry, I think that Michelle should have been allowed to finish what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. You don't know that she was talking about on item 33. Um, she was making a point that she unfairly shut down. Um, thank you. and. What I want to talk about is I'm holding in my hand right now a business reporting spreadsheet. And I just wanted to let the ladies and gentlemen of this community and on the call and in the meeting know that they are promoting uh, snitching. They are keeping a spreadsheet of everybody who is snitched on. It's an alphabetical hoarder here. I bet some of these business, I'm publishing this later. Some of these businesses are going to uh, be surprised to find they're on here. Um, we are being snitched on by people and we're not allowed to face our accuser. So I'd like to know some rules around the spreadsheet, how, how we need access to the spreadsheet in a timely manner. And Courtney requested for several days before she got it. Could somebody please answer what the turnaround time is for these spreadsheets and where they are publicly so that the public has access to them? Again, we cannot respond to any public comments. So the questions will be directed to our CEO. He'll be able to respond. Uh, please send him your communication so we can reach you. All right, thank you. Next speaker. Courtney, if you could please state your name. Good morning. My name is Courtney Evans. I would like to request that item number 33 be taken off the agenda. I've been coming to these meetings for three years requesting a process to 
hold the board accountable and keep record of complaints and concerns from the public. Courtney, you have a really bad echo. I don't know if you can step aside, maybe or something. Uh, okay, I can start again. Is that better? Why don't we come back to Courtney? Can you hear me now? No, Courtney, you have a really bad echo. We're going to come back to you if you want to work out your tech. We'll come back to you. Valerie, if you can please say your name. You know what? Um, uh, Courtney, uh, put Courtney on hold, try to figure out her uh, technical problem. And then once we figure, once she figures them out, we'll go back to her. But next on the list. Valerie, if you could please state your name. Uh, yes, this is Valerie Eglund with Reach San Benito Park Foundation. Uh, I would like to actually speak to the uh, Strata Verde uh, issue, and I believe it's already on the agenda. Yes, it is. Okay, okay. I just wanted to be sure that it was not in closed session or something. Um, no. Sorry. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll reserve the comments for then. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam. Next speaker. Hunter, if you could please state your name. Hunter Cuneo, resident of San Benito County. Uh, I just want to, I just got confirmation that both Ace Hardware and Knob Hill and other stores are putting in TV monitoring systems right now up in their entranceways. And when asked why they're doing so, they were told, the employee told us that it was at request of the county or city, they are not sure. So I wanna get confirmation on that. Hey, if this has anything to do with item 33, please confirm. And, and we want to know who has told these stores that they need to be putting in government cameras watching citizens as they go in. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. Clay Kemp, Executive Director of the Seniors Council Area Agency. All right, there we go. Start again. Yes, sir. Clay Camp, Executive Director of the Seniors Council Area Agency on Aging. And I just want to share a project we're working on that we're pretty excited about. Uh, there's about a dozen of these projects going around the state, and it's to create a no wrong door system for older adults or people with disabilities. So we're trying to get uh, a unified place to go and get services and make sure that other agencies that might provide services to this population also connect with that entity. So Hovindas de Antonio, as probably you may have guessed, is gonna be our focal place for that. We've received both some state and federal dollars to make this happen. So coming in the next year, you'll hear more about it. But since I was here, it's been on my to-do list to share with the board for quite some time. So I thought I'd take advantage of that. Um, the aging, the county's aging and long-term care commission has stepped up to be the official advisory body to us. So we make sure we're interacting with all the key entities in the county and uh, looking forward to strengthening our services to older adults and people with disabilities and thought the board should be aware of this effort. Thank you for the report. Andy Shostamone. Over here, Andy. Hi, good morning. My name is Andy Shaw Koran. I am speaking not in my capacity as president of Preserve Our Rural Communities, but as a private citizen with deep concerns about governance in San Benito County. Um, several things have made me believe that the folks in charge of our county, our supervisors, don't have deep concern about either public health or about democracy. First was the essential pushing of Dr. Marty, one of the most competent um, public officials in the state, out. You were- hey Andy, Andy, I'm sorry. We're gonna discuss, you may have an opportunity to discuss that, uh, that on item number 33. Well, I, 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 I will talk about more general concerns about- Okay, if it's, if, it's, if it's not related to the presentation by Tracy on the Corona 19, please continue. Okay, so this lack of concern, I think, about uh, the public and more of a concern about what business interests have, what their priorities has caused this council to both undermine democracy and undermine public health. And I think that uh, if this were different circumstances, if it was safe 
for our public to go out and collect signatures, I would be looking at collecting signatures to recall a number of you on this office because of the fact that I believe that your priorities are not that of public health, nor of what the people have voiced their concerns about. And so th that's the general concern, and I, I really worry about it because we have a crisis of democracy in this country from the very top on down, where people are losing faith, where we have a president who says he might not even honor the election coming up in November. And it, I think it's incumbent upon all of you to begin to start to restore some faith in the people uh, because our, the moves we've made here have both imperiled public health and imperiled public confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. We have no more public comments. If you wish to make a comment, press star nine or raise your hand. Courtney, Courtney, can we go back to Courtney Evans, please? Courtney? Hi there, can you hear me? We can hear you, Courtney, go ahead. Perfect, thank you so much. Good morning. I would like to request that item number 33 be removed. I've come to this board multiple times in the last three years to request putting on our agenda a moral and ethics requirement and agreement with the board, also a way to um, hold our board accountable by letting the public have a streamlined process to have written concerns, complaints, and a process to look at the history of our board members and their actions and what the public think and their opinions and views on their decisions. Um, that would make us educated voters when that time comes up for our elected officials to run again or or not um seeing as that i've requested this at least seven times and it's never been placed on the agenda but yet we have something on the agenda to punish our um, citizens to punish our community your constituents so seeing as that none of my requests have been granted to place accountability factors upon our board and the decisions that they make, I ask that number 33 on the agenda be removed. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Any other speaker cards? We have no more. No more? Okay, before we continue, uh, we have a request to move item number 33 from the public. Does the board wish to move item number 33? No. Remove it? Nope. Yes. That's a one. I'm sorry. All those in favor of removing, say aye. Aye. All those in favor against? Aye. 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 Okay, let me do a roll call and I apologize. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez? Yes. Supervisor Jim Gilliam? No, discuss and um, have leave it on the agenda, please. So you're, you're a no. Thank you, Supervisor Gilliam. Supervisor Mark Medina? No. Thank you. Supervisor uh, Patel? No. And Supervisor Del Cruz is no. So uh, one more to not remove it. Okay. <clears throat> so it stays on the agenda. Thank you. Now we will continue with um, department head announcements. Uh, Ray? Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to go ahead and invite up Chris Mang Mangano. Uh, she is our OES manager, and she's going to give your board an update concerning Great Plates. Good morning. Chris Mangana with the Office of Emergency Services, giving an update on the Great Plates program that was introduced in mid-April by our Governor Gavin Newsom. He announced the launch of the first ever um, in the United States, um, Great Plates Delivered Program, providing delivery of prepared meals to local restaurant to local residents, from restaurants to homebound seniors and high-risk individuals during the pandemic. San Benito County forged relationships with the United Way, Community Foundation, COG, and County Express, and the Senior Councils of Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties to manage the program. The agencies work together to solicit restaurants, qualify senior citizens for the temporary program, and arrange delivery of the meals. 
In addition to providing meals for seniors, Great Plates Delivered provided essential economic stimulus to local resident restaurants struggling to stay in business during the pandemic. Seven restaurants participated in the program, 4th Street Eatery, Be True Cafe, Grillin' and Chillin', Eva Mays Cafe, Flapjacks, Mission Cafe, and the Inn at Trespinos. The program has delivered nearly 200 people just over 10,900 meals since its inception, and the program is scheduled to end August 7th. Without the help of Vicki Fortino with United Way, Clay Kemp with the Seniors Council, Regina and Mary with COG, Leona with County Express, and my staff, we could not have made this happen. My personal thanks to each of you. I'd also personally like to thank the restaurants for their support. And we do have a certificate of appreciation to present to the restaurants today. Um, thank you. Thank you. Questions on the board? I'd like to make a comment, uh, Gilio. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say thank you to our county team members, to um, all the people that volunteered to deliver meals, um, uh, everybody you just mentioned. And, and um, it, this is uh, an example of all of us working very hard together. This was a ton of work for staff and team and the community. And I, I just really want to say uh, thank you guys for all banding together on it and, and good, good work um, getting the food out to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Gilly. Any other questions to the board? None? Anyone from the public? None? Okay. We have one. Yes, we have one. Chair. Clay Kemp from Seniors yes. Council. And I just want to return the thanks to Chris and to Ray also, because when this first became available to us, it was kind of obvious that no single agency could pull this together. So we had about a five minute discussion about how and why we couldn't do this. And then it immediately flipped to seeing how different partners could could take on one piece of it and make it forward, make it move forward and happen. And Chris and Ray were just all over that right from the start saying, well, let's do this. Let's see if we can bring in all these partners and make it happen. And that happened very quickly and successfully. And San Benito County is one of the few rural counties that pulled this off. So thanks to all of you and congratulations. Really helped a lot of people in a lot of restaurants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I really may just say, uh, I'd like to thank each one of you, um, the restaurants and all the assistants. I can tell you, it was a, it was a hurdle. Um, most, again, to reiterate that, most of the rural counties, just it was too monumental to actually take this task on. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, there has been a lot of great um, feedback um, from our elderly community. And, um, and, and hoping that maybe we can continue this down the road in some fashion. So anyways, I just wanted to thank each one of you. Thank Chris as well, because it was, it was definitely a tall task for everybody. And it was, it was quick. We had to put together, normally it takes probably six months to a year to build a program like this, not a couple of weeks. So, so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right? Yes, I'd like to um, also uh, mention that um, there will be some road work done. Um, I wanted to highlight this for the public. Beginning July 27, 2020, Union Road, there'll be a project done, uh, work done on Union Road, and that'll be funded for Measure G and SB1, uh, respectively. I want to make sure that the public is aware that the road work will begin at 7 a.m. and should last to 4 p.m., and it will um, mainly be a, a one-way traffic back and forth. So just expect some delays during that time. Uh, shouldn't be too many delays out in that area, but, uh, but you could be. So just wanted to make sure that the public was aware of it, as well as um, we have a, a large list of construction projects, uh, road projects and bridge projects that will be um, undertaking in the next few months and I wanted to make sure that that everyone is aware of it and we'll be um, actually sending out uh, messages um, and the construction companies will also be displaying uh, signs for everyone to be aware in advance the plan is two weeks or approximately two weeks in advance prior to construction so again this is great work um, on behalf of uh, the board 
and staff, and as well as uh, again from the from the residents within the community uh, with regards to some of the Measure G money at work. So I just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. Um, as well as um, I was just made aware from our behavioral health office to remove number eight from consent. Um, that item will be um, heard at a later date. So um, item number eight, I'm made aware of. So that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So we're, we're removing it to a future meeting. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Now we'll go to supervisor's uh, report. Supervisor Gillio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My report's going to be a little bit longer than normal today, and I appreciate your uh, indulgence. Um, Number one, we ran into an issue out on um, the uh, Sienega Road construction. There was uh, just a little bit of confusion over, over naming of uh, roads and sections, and that'll be coming back to the board on uh, August 4th for a correction of a short section to be added to that project out there just for the public's knowledge. And um, that was actually discovered by a constituent noticing the placement of the sign. So we're working on cleaning that up. And um, essentially what you'll have out there is from the brand new hospital we have some feedback from somebody, I'm not sure who, um, but we have uh, at the, the brand new Hospital Road Bridge, you'll have um, from there all the way up past Hidden Valley is kind of phase one, and uh, that'll be um, completed. It's uh, beginning construction, actual seed and dirt move in the beginning of August. And then uh, second phase is gonna be from there to Mudstone Ranch. And then third phase next year will be from Mudstone Ranch all the way up to what they call Bird Creek, which is the first uh, little area after you come down the other side of the hill. Uh, there's a camping area right before you get to the main entrance of Hollister Hill. So there's been a lot of questions in that area. That's why I wanted to bring that one up. Over the last, uh, uh, I, I've, I've been, uh, it's been a pleasure for me to be on this board for the last year and a half. Uh, I've been um, fortunate to work with a, an amazing group of uh, county team members as well as uh, board members. Uh, some of the accomplishments, um, I think we lose sight of this every once in a while and I, I wanna make sure that, that it's, it's out there and you know things are happening and, and that the, the county is, is working for you guys and as well as the Board of Supervisors is working for you guys. Um, We've, you know, uh, we went through and we implemented a step G. We were having retention problems at the sheriff's department. So we implemented a step G program to bring them onto parity with other uh, dep area departments as well as um, local, uh, the other county uh, employees as well, county team members, because they were one of the only ones without a uh, step G. We implemented open government, Stuart, um, amazing. We're seeing that in the first time in the budget. It's unparalleled transparency. I believe we're the first county in the state. Is that accurate? To have it up live and running, to be able to have constituents and customers and anybody around the world, frankly, that has internet access, to dive deep into our budget and see what's going on and be able to inform themselves and ask questions and that sort of thing. So it, that's pretty amazing. It may sound like a small thing, but it's no small feat to get that done, uh, especially with our limited staffing. Uh, CSAs, CSAs, when uh, we, we uh, in the last couple of years have been an ongoing uh, issue and problem, and that's county service areas for folks that aren't aware of that. And we, we really, really uh, fought through some barricades there through with our legal teams, with our admin, with our RMA department, and, and that I think is, is on a, a, a route to um, doing, doing well. Um, people seem to be satisfied with what's going on with the county service areas. Currently, we can't forget and we need to stay on that. Uh, John Smith Road, we uh, repaved. Um, uh, that was one of the ones that was uh, used uh, in enterprise funds out there, pretty big. Roads, um, you're gonna see over $10 million, that's 10 million with an M, uh, uh, in the next year between now and actually maybe by the end of the year. Um, and then um, bridge projects, that's over 50 million. So all these things are back on track and happening, good stuff. Uh, grand jury. Um, we raised the budget by over 75% and brought it back to the pre-2015 levels. So that's the civil grand jury that holds us elected people accountable, as well as other special districts and elected folks accountable. Um, we went after Airbnb for their TOT and got the TOT tax back uh, assigned to the county. Um, our, again, our bridge work over five bridges, uh, five bridges over 60 million. I, I had it off just a little bit. Um, one of the bigger things that we got the economic department, uh, economic development corporation back rolling funded and we're chasing economic development dollars. We've had businesses expand recently. We just had a, uh, a business go to the, um, uh, planning commission last week and, you know, hit that, hit the, uh, doubling their capacity and 
even in the uh, coronavirus times, we're bringing in jobs. I'm extremely proud of my time working with the county team members as well as my uh, fellow board members. That's what makes my next statement incredibly difficult. I'm, uh, I'm stepping down as your supervisor for District 4. Coronavirus has changed our um, local family small business to where I can't do both. I can't effectively represent you guys fairly. I can't serve our team members. I can't um, be a good dad for my daughter and my family and then run my business. So it, as you can tell, it's incredibly difficult for me to tell you this, but it's something that I need to do. Today is my last meeting and my, um, my last day with the county will be uh, July 31st. And what I wanna do is I have a lot of um, uh, things working with admin, with RMA, with legal, and with constituents. I wanna make sure that I sew that up and make sure that those people have uh, support so they're not just dropped and, and forgotten about. And um, you can imagine, you can see it in me. It's, it's a incredibly hard statement for me to sit here and make for you, but it's what I have to do for my, my business and my family. I, I can't with the changing coronavirus times, uh, it's nearly impossible to find staffing to keep my, my business rolling. I have to be there. I have to be there um, 10 hours a day. And if I'm not there 10 hours a day, the, the, it's gonna be trouble. And my wife, my wife's there now. And um, anyways, with that being said, I'm not gonna keep rambling. I think uh, I've said enough and um, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate your support, your um, encouragement over the, over the uh, last period of time. And, and I sincerely um, am gonna miss um, this position and, and working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. <clears throat> Supervisor Hernandez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, wow, that was that was pretty heavy to hear from Supervisor Galio. And although we don't always agree, we've had many of times when we've agreed and and I know uh, and supported each other. So I. I I really do wish him the best, and I really do wish that everything with his family and with his business gets settled, and may God bless you, Supervisor Gilio. Um That being said, uh, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with tough times right now when it comes to COVID-19. Um, no one's denying this virus. No one's denying the impacts. Um, there's a lot of questions as to the extent, but nonetheless, there's issues with uh, that I feel have been to a certain extent kicked off to the side a lot with uh, you know and I know we're to a certain extent from what we're getting with the CARES funding we're, we're trying to roll out some help to the businesses uh, I've been part of a lot of meetings with business owners and dealing with the impacts and, and uh, I know we're going to be talking pretty soon about enforcement item 33 um, but uh, I just wanted to report that businesses are suffering and uh, and I, I really can't stand hearing someone pitch <clears throat> um, that businesses by default are selfish. I feel like that's an innately selfish statement by, de you know, because if you think about it, that, that assumes that a business, uh, if it goes away, it's okay. It's for the greater good. And so that, that I struggle with that immensely when, uh, when somehow public health and business are opposite of each other, when everything that I've learned about business from business owners, from engaging in these conversations is uh, it's very, doable and if anything they are the front lines um, with dealing with protecting the public health when it comes to their customers so uh, I wanted to stress that business owners are not your enemy they're your friends they care about you they already have licenses that say they have to even if they didn't care about you which I know that's not true uh, they have licenses that, that push them in the position to have to address concerns with the public health and I think that's a, a it's a very dishonest statement to say that somehow if you're a business owner you're selfish and I don't so um, with, you know, dealing with, with now um, the school impacts, we're, we're coming up on, on a, the opening of schools and, and I've learned a lot and I appreciate the supervisor supporting me being engaged in the conversations with the, with the County Office of Ed and the, and the different school districts. Um, I meant what I said. I mean, ultimately I feel like, especially even with what Supervisor Gillard mentioned, it's we, we can't assume that the impacts of, this, of, of these rules, which are ever-changing and very contradicting many a times, 
um, we can just let the public absorb them by themselves. I feel like we have to engage, and that's why that's what was my intent is to understand the impacts and uh, the consistent statement definitely from the schools that I'm that I'm learning is um, they want to protect public health. They're going to follow the rules. They just need some flexibility to figure out how to make that happen. So, uh, so I just wanted to report that out that it's 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 becoming an immense lift, and the idea of shutting down, not allowing schools to open at all, um, is going to have huge ramifications to our county that we're we're not even um, assuming yet to understand. Um, and to think that we understand, I think, puts us in a tough position to for that damage to be worse. So. Um, so I just really wanted to, to address that we, we should have an ongoing conversation with the schools, not to say that we have any authority over them, but at least to help under, to, for us to understand and then for us to help be part of the solution and not just sit back and watch it happen. You know, I can't do that to my community. Um, I feel like I'm missing something, but um, that's the extent of my report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Hernandez. Supervisor Mark Medina? Nothing, sir. Thank you. Supervisor Anthony Matlow? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, got dropped off. Uh, apparently, our, our internet out here is not very good either. But um, I kind of came back in about halfway, or maybe a little bit further than um, halfway through uh, Supervisor Gilio's uh, comments. and. Um, I, 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 this is a, people don't realize how hard this job is right now. And uh, for the five of us, uh, we're, we're doing the best we can. It's a lot more time than, um, than what it normally takes because of the COVID crisis and things that we're working on. And uh, Supervisor Gabriel, uh, it's been on the board for you know a couple of years now and he's been just an outstanding supervisor to work with he understands the issues understands how to work with people um it, and this you know i wish he would reconsider uh stepping down uh and just uh, continue to serve but uh i'm kind of at a loss for words um right now uh hearing what i just heard so uh, you know i i hope uh he reconsiders uh this but but i completely understand uh you, you have your business you have your family uh and uh it's it's conflicting it really is it, it's hard and uh you know in any case i appreciate everything he's been doing and is going to do in the community uh, going forward, and uh, we're we're friends. That's what I got, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Hernandez, Supervisor Gilio, Supervisor Mark Medina. Um, my only comment is, uh, Supervisor Gilio, thank you for serving as the county supervisor for your uh, district. Uh, you you challenged me to a lot of issues, and and thank you for actually. During those moments, I, I realized that some of the mistakes that I made and some of the disagreements that we agreed to disagree, at the end of the day, we said we're still co-workers. And, and I really do appreciate that type of the discussion that you bring to the table. And it's going to be hard to replace you. Uh, but like Supervisor Tello, him and I, we have 16 years of experience. We, we always like to see good quality leadership stay on board while us old geezers like me and Anthony, you know, walk away. But um, your decision, we support what you what you want to do and how you want to do it, especially when, in light of your family and your business. They, I can't I can't blame you for any of that stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, before before we continue, um, there's some changes to the agenda. We're going to uh, pull item number 16 for Supervisor Patello, and also we're going to move item. Um, Right after 30, 30, 34, uh, that's right after 34, we're gonna go into closed session for one item only. And then we'll come back and, to, and then we'll continue with 35. Do any of the other supervisors wish to pull any of the other items? Did you say 16 was already pulled? 
Yes, 16. Uh, Super Rosa Patello wants to pull that from consent. And number eight. Number seven. And Mr. Chair, number, oh, number eight. Number eight needs to be pulled completely. Okay. For discussion, yes, so did I. That's, that's why I asked. Okay. Supervisor Patel wants to pull number eight and number 16. Is that correct? Negative. No, no, no. This is Ray, uh, Supervisor uh, um, Jaime de la Cruz. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, yes. we need to pull number eight completely from the agenda. And then number 16 will be heard by Supervisor Patel. Correct. Got it. Got it. Okay, and then we'll definitely for your request remove item eight. Okay, um, any other changes by the board? Anyone from the public wish to uh, move, remove any of the items out of consent? Yes, Jared, you have been unmuted. I'm sorry, what was that? We have one. Okay, which number? Jared, if you could please unmute yourself. Okay, and I have a hard time technically hearing. One of the super tell me which number they requested to move. Stand by one minute, uh, Mr. Chair. They're trying to get Jared on the line. We don't know what number he wanted to pull yet. Okay, thank you. I'm here. Yes, sir. I wanted to uh, bring up a couple of quick things. You can't uh, say, I apologize, all, sir. Excuse, sir. I'm sorry, you can't do that. You have to either tell me which items you like to pull out of consent, and that's the only thing I'm allowed at this moment. I'll wait. Thank you. Okay, is there a motion to approve amended agenda? Motion to approve uh, the amended uh, consent agenda. Second. Medina, second. Motion fellow second by Medina. Aye. 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 Okay, now we'll go to item 16. Supervisor Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I mean, I give up sending a letter. I think the situation has changed a little bit with uh, the hair uh, salons that they're able to operate uh, outside. Uh, they've made that change in the last day or two. But I still think we should send a letter to the cosmetology board thanking them for making those changes um, and you know, looking for outside of the box uh, things to try to keep you know, people uh, able to work and make a livelihood. But we also probably need to uh, send a letter to the governor, uh, also thanking him for his support on that and his work, but also remind him that uh, these other businesses that are dimmed uh, by his words have invested a lot of money and, you know, they're trying to comply with, you know, the initial guidances and a lot of them are being punished um, for something that, uh, you know, I'm not sure if we have uh, enough data that, that substantiates that they're the, the, the problem to begin with. And, uh, you know, and if it is, I, I think us on a local level should be uh, brought to speed as far as, you know, what that is. Yeah, but you know, we, we do have to continue to support um, our businesses and uh, uh, urge, you know, our state leaders or, or the governor specifically that uh, people make a, a big investment to reopen the doors, big investment in time training employees uh, and uh, giving up a lot of their uh, capacity uh, to, you know, Try to make it through these uh, very difficult times, and so my suggestion to you, sir, uh, is that we uh, rewrite that letter, authorize you to sign it, or, or the whole board could come in. I, I know I signed that letter that's on the agenda today, um, and um, kind of re uh, support not only the, the hairstylists and personal groomers but also the other businesses that are affected, the gyms and uh, 
indoor dining and so forth uh, that are trying to um, you know comply with the state guidances made the investment and are really not um, the uh, culprits as far as this spike in uh, caseloads for uh, COVID. Thank That's you. That's kind of my comments, Mr. Chair. If it's okay with the board, uh, I think it'll probably be better that Supervisor Hernandez and Supervisor Patello draft that letter with the, with the Ray and then have us, have us view it and sign it, all five of us, because both you and, and Supervisor Hernandez have been dealing with the business. So I have a feeling you guys have a better direct relationship with a lot of the businesses and understand what their needs are. If it's okay with the board, it, have Anthony Hernandez draft it, uh, but I want to hear input from, from the board. Uh, Supervisor Gilio? Yes, I agree. Thank you. Supervisor Mark Medina? I agree, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, Anthony and Peter, will you guys please work with me and then draft the letter and then we'll all sign it and we'll send it to the governor and then any other uh, upper officials that you feel might uh, listen to our needs? Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, if it's okay with Supervisor Hernandez, we'll get right on it uh, uh, this uh, this week and have it done. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Now back to item number no, no. 16. Is there a what do we need to I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I probably interrupted the chair just about public comment. Yes. Okay. Is there anyone from the public on number 16? If you wish to make a comment, press star nine or raise your hand. We have one in the chamber. I want it. You're supposed to come up and get one, You're supposed to come up and get one, ma'am. I'm Morris Lopez. I'm a San Benito County resident in San Juan Matista. I'm also a health care oh, provider. I just want to speak to the item 16 regarding opening up outdoor hair cutting services or styling services. I'm standing here as a product of a DIY do it yourself haircut and color. So I welcome this as a hair care provider. Um, being outside, I remember as a young child seeing my uncle and my grandfather and my grandmother give my little cousins a bowl cut uh, very safely in the garage or outside. <laughs> so I feel that this is a wonderful idea coming from a health care perspective. You're isolated, you're outdoors in the open air as long as they limit who can be in their little outdoor booth. I feel that it's 100% more safe than the allowed um, bars that are open as long as they're serving meals. I vehemently oppose that move. I think it's very dangerous to mix alcohol and food because you're kind of confusing the issue. Is it a bar? Is it a restaurant? No, it's a bar. And when you add food to that to make it okay, you're skirting the system. You're also making it unsafe for the patrons. And that's happening in my downtown of San Juan Batista. Um, Supervisor Batello is here speaking on this. I wish you would look at this, but I'm 100% behind opening outdoor barber shops. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any thoughts from the public? If you could please state Yeah, this is Michelle. This is Michelle from Salon 218. Yes, ma'am. And um, I wanted to address the outdoor issue. Um, it's nice to hear people say that they have great memories from that kind of stuff, but as a professional in the industry, it's a very unrealistic thing for people to think about. How many people would like to have food uh, eating in a restaurant next to a hair salon? The hair will fly, and our job as professionals is to, is to protect the community from infectious diseases and viruses that's in our, in our bylaws as hairstylists. And to me, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous to think that somebody could cut hair outside. Yeah, you see people do that in parks, different places, but, but realistically, we can't do colors. People can't go inside and, do, <clears throat> and rinse their colors. We can't send people home with chemicals in their hair. We need, to, we need to think realistically, and clearly, people do not understand our industry, and that's what makes it really difficult. And, and about state board, on, on board with state board, they were not even available when we were trying to contact them to get guidelines. They were closed. So we've had to come up with a lot of stuff on our, on our own. So this whole issue with doing hair outside seriously, do you really want to eat hair? Because that's what it comes down to. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. 
Next speaker. We do not. We do not have any more comments. Okay. Mr. Chair? What's the Mr. Chair? On number 16? Mr. Chair. Oh. This is Mark Medina. Someone? I'd like to say something real quick. Go ahead, sir. You know, just listening to the last speaker, it uh, made me think about something. I was intending to talk about this later on, but this might be the appropriate time is, you know, we put the hairstylists, the restaurants, and the uh, gyms through hoops in order to uh, open up safely. They spent thousands and thousands of dollars with plexiglass, with different ways to uh, make sure that there was six feet apart, making sure that only one person was in there at a time, checking temperatures, calling. And the issue that I see, and I'm trying to ask for some advice here is we have a tracing program so how many cases have we had due to a hairstylist a restaurant or the gyms and that's that's what I think we need to send a letter asking why hair salons or I should say yes yeah, salons if there has, there's no proof that there has been any infections in that area. I don't know how to word that, but I'm just asking the uh, Supervisor Batello and Supervisor Hernandez, what can we do in that letter in order to uh, include this somehow? Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, Supervisor Hernandez. Hernandez. Yeah, so that's an excellent question, Supervisor Medina. Um, and, and the thought that I had, and I was going to actually mention this, uh, but uh, this is why it's a good idea to have a, an open dialogue with the businesses that are directly involved. I feel like there's wisdom in the counsel of, of these folks to, to understand their industries. That's always been the intention um, to a certain extent of, of even the focus group meetings is to have an open dialogue. So I agree with that sentiment. It's not that simple of an answer, but if we had some really good questions to ask to frame that dialogue in a way that directs better solutions, then I think that's going to create a, a, a all the way around, right? We're, we're listening to the businesses. We're not just telling them what to do. We're, we're, we're using their ed, their experience, their their professional background to educate us on how to make it more practical. And honestly, that's been kind of the, from the get-go of all this. That's really has been my sentiment is, yes, there has to be rules, but maybe those rules need to involve the folks that are actually involved in these in industries so that they're the ones guiding the success and we're not just assuming that's gonna be an easy outcome. So I would recommend that we have a meeting with these folks uh, and, and then that way we draft the letter in a way that's a lot more consistent with the reality that they're living in. Those are my comments, Mr. Is Chair. Is there any objection to that idea? No objection. Uh, Gilio, can I make a comment please, Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, just briefly. So I, I think uh, Supervisor Medina's comments are right on target is um, we, we need to um, see where locally. And, and I think one of the biggest complaints that I hear uh, regarding the state's um, on again, off again type of enforcement stuff is, is the hatchet versus a scalp, scalpel, so to speak, that old saying. If there if there is an, an in industry or a, a situation or a cause that is, you know, we're, we're, we're statewide and countywide, we're investing a ton of money on contract tracing. Let's really focus on that and focus on what, what that is. And if there is something in our county that we see through contact tracing that is regularly uh, occurring, deal with it with a scalpel and not, not a, uh, a hatchet. And maybe that could be in your letter as well that, you know, here, here's what we see locally. These are causing um, issues for us locally, but these other issues that you're bringing up, we've had zero or you know low low numbers. So, just a, a couple more thoughts for that letter. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Gilio. Um, uh, my my question more to staff and 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 I ask I have asked Ray this many many times is that I I think it's time for us to know where these cases are coming because Supervisor Medina does bring up a, a good question is. Uh, well, what the spawn is not not the source of the positives. Should we penalize them? And I think that's a legit question. And 
I mean, I think Ray, you need to go back and provide better reports and see where the where the industries are, are, are or the sources are coming from. I, I think that's legit, legit questions. You know, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may add, uh, I really think that we would be better served if, if we had a, a lot more control locally as far as uh, evaluating businesses that, you know, might pose a little bit more of a risk. Uh, but, uh, you know, for a fact, a lot of these, uh, you know, personal uh, hair groomers and stylists have put a lot of money into their shops. You know, the restaurants have put a lot of money in their, their uh, businesses, and it's just, uh, it's getting punitive now. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I think we're all singing the same tune, so uh, Supervisor Hernandez and Patello, please draft that, that memo and then let the board sign it, and then we'll send it out. Thank okay? You, do, we need to make, do we need to approve number 16, or is it something that we can wait for the next meeting? Do you want it to come back to the board or do you want to just make a motion right now yes. i'd like oh, you to know make what? a motion right now i think we should i think we should approve it amend it uh per super and, and, and patello and we'll all sign it not such an important letter going to you know to the governor's office um maybe we better just bring bring back Okay. Uh, the letter to you on August 4th, I believe. Yeah, that's the next meeting. And then also, would you and Supervisor Tello meet with the barbers and the salons, get their perspective? Maybe you can incorporate some of their concerns in that letter. I'd like to get, try to get the restaurants as well. You got it. Okay. Any Jackson from the board on that? No, okay, let's continue that. We are done with consent, and we'll start on number 33. Tracy. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, this item um, will be presented to us by um, our public health office, uh, Lynn Mello, and we also have Dr. G on the line. So I'll go ahead and pass it to Lynn Mello. Good morning, uh, Honorable Chair De La Cruz and um, board. Uh, I I'm a little... Um, Surprised and stunned um, to hear of the news of um, Supervisor Gilio. I just want to say thank you for your support to um, Health and Human Services and Public Health. Um, I appreciate uh, all that you've done to um, help us combat this um, this disease, and I wish you the very best. And uh, I understand um, your reason. So thanks again. Um, so is. Uh, is Janet controlling the uh, PowerPoint? There we go. I don't know if that's Dulce or Janet. Thank you so much. Nope, maybe not. Shall we bring it up ourselves? We're working on it. They'll have it up in a second here. Okay. Actually, can we take a quick five minute break? Let them set up. Sure. Let's take a quick one and a break. <laughs>
I'm going to... If you're ready. Okay, we're ready. All right. Um, actually, we're going to bring it back to Ray. Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we're at item number 33 today. It's out of Health and Human Services. I'm going to go ahead and read for the record uh, the agenda item. Receive presentation and update from Health and Human Services Public Health Services on the yeah. respiratory disease coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. Adopt urgency ordinance incorporating by reference and authorizing civil enforcement of state of California COVID-19 emergency orders. Directives and guidance as civil infractions or other civil enforcement requires a four-fifths vote. If urgency ordinance uh, does not receive four-fifths vote, read title, waive further reading, accept introduction, and continue to 8420 meeting for adoption. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to go ahead and um, pass this to Lynn Mallow and she'll start her presentation. Lynn? Yes, good morning again, everyone. Um, yeah, I'd like to um, thank Dr. Gilarducci for updating the slides in uh, Tracy's absence as we continue to, um, you know, work diligently on trying to uh, mitigate um, the spread of this disease in our community and prevent unnecessary um, uh, chronic illness and death. So uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? Uh, as you all know, we continue to be on the um, state watch list. Um, and so we are under um, state and California Department of Public Health and the governor um, orders for restrictions uh, for certain um, activities that are risky for um, spreading uh, coronavirus. Um, we currently have 57 active cases. Um, and we, uh, you know, of course, for a total of 448 cases that have been confirmed in our community. Um, and we average probably somewhere be between 10 and 20 cases, new cases a day. Some days there are three cases, some days there are uh, 25 or 30 cases. Um, I have four nurses that are um, continuing to do the case investigations. Um, and because um, the case counts are going up, so the, the, the number of active cases at one time, uh, are you know they they're going up? We are um, having to modify how constantly having to modify how we um, uh, we address these, and uh, we've been bringing on more contact tracers, um, and um, we've been training them from um, our health education unit, and so those are staff that normally work in tobacco. Um, education and control and policy and then uh, um, staff that are uh, working on the opioid grants and in nutrition and um, we also have folks from uh, the human side of the agency that are trained to be contact tracers um, and they work in social services and then um, I'm in touch with a couple of folks in the community that have uh, a doctor and her pre-med school um, daughter who are very interested in volunteering to do contact tracing with us. And so we're working on getting them on as volunteers. So we're doing very well in the contact tracing area and um, we are reaching out to every case that is reported to us. Um, we now have a um, Medi nurse line that was launched by the state that's going to be extremely helpful uh, in reducing some of our medical uh, questions that we have to answer. And we spend a lot of time talking with people that, um, you know, our patients that may have questions after we've done the investigation. Uh, so we have this Medi nurse line that's been launched by the state. We can refer folks to that line um, to, to speak with nurses. Um, and then can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and so, as you see, and I'm going to hand this over to Dr. G, but, um, you know, the majority of our cases continue to be person to person. And then, you know, the next highest 
uh, group are uh, community transmission. And so when we refer to community transmission, um, oftentimes those folks just don't know where they got it. They've been living their lives and they, uh, you know, they get sick, they get tested, and they find out that they are positive, you know, they have a positive case of, um, of coronavirus. And, and just, uh, you know, in a general, just touching on, um, on uh, Supervisor Medina's question, I won't go into detail right now, but what I will say is that we have cases across the spectrum. We have cases from agriculture, from restaurants, from hair salons, from construction, from retail, from preschools, and some of our largest employers in the community. So, so the virus is, uh, you know, is, is prevails throughout the community. And um, luckily, we're, you know, we're smaller, and it's a little bit uh, uh, easier for us to um, to reach out to those reported cases. Um, in the larger counties, what we're finding is that, um, you know, they are, it's, it's become so um, prevalent in the communities that they uh, are just no longer doing contact tracing. We never want to get to that point. Uh, we want to continue this contact tracing. We, we find that it's valuable in, and we find that people that uh, we speak with on the phone are, for the most part, willing to quarantine and those that are sick are willing to isolate uh, for the, um, the time frames that we give them. And um, I feel that we've been very successful in our contact tracing um, and uh, isolation efforts. Um, at this time, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. G and um, let him report out on uh, some of these numbers. And we also have um, Mallory, our epidemiologist, uh, epidemiologist available uh, to chime in. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Lynn, for that great report. And I want to thank Mallory while I have the opportunity for all the hard work that she's been doing in the background. I also want to thank the board for your strong support and leadership, in particular, Supervisor Julio, who's been uh, a great partner over the years with respect to our EMS issues and, and the coronavirus in particular. And I just know that this has been tough on everybody. Uh, certainly public health is feeling the strain. Uh, we have uh, health officers resigning all over the state. Um, public health nurses are working to the, to the limit of their endurance. So uh, unfortunately, we're in a marathon now. We're on maybe mile four of the marathon. I don't know exactly where, but just want to keep that in perspective. So uh, a few quick slides, uh, I'll go rather quickly. This information is available on the website, but uh, obviously we can make this PowerPoint available as well. But uh, I want to point out to the table on the top of this slide, and I really in particular want to point out the 18 to 49 year old age group. And this is a, a trend that we're seeing nationwide and California wide, that this seems to be the biggest group right now contributing to uh, the spread. And um, there are a lot of theories about this. One is that uh, obviously these are people that are in the workforce, number one, but also they may also perceive the risk to themselves to be somewhat low and, and maybe underestimate the risk to others that this may be causing. This was, uh, I think, one of the reasons why bars uh, were targeted as uh, uh, closures uh, throughout the country, because it's an area where this kind of mixing and this age group can, can occur. So, um, you know, if there was one thing we could change is when we started to reopen, we um, personally, I feel like we should have messaged stronger. I didn't expect that people would let their guard down to the extent that they did, but I think nationwide we failed to message that uh, even though we're reopening, life is not completely back to normal. And certainly um, the um, measures that we've been promoting all along, uh, including uh, social distancing and hand washing and mask wearing are, are, are continue to be hugely important. I wanna draw your attention to the uh, bar graph down below. And um, as you can see, the volume of cases far exceed anything we experienced early in the spring at the beginning here. Uh, we're starting to see strains uh, throughout California on hospital supply, particularly ICU capacity. Uh, one thing that uh, I will caution is if you look at the far right bars, the 7.5 to 7.11 and the 7.12 to 7.18, this may, uh, these might appear to show that um, the, the worst is over and we're starting to trend down, but what we found is, is that these two bars tend to grow um, 
because of delayed reporting and so forth. So these are, I would not hang your hats on these, uh, the two far right bars that will know more in a week or so what those are gonna look like. Um, next slide, please. So this shows uh, the orange counties here are the counties that are on the watch list. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's only two counties in the Bay Area that are not on the list. Kern County probably will be on the list in the next day or two. Um, and it just seems to be spreading um, north, uh, northward. Um, statewide, um, the uh, number of cases is about 300 per uh, 100,000. Um, and the t test positivity rate I'll point out here is about 7.4% uh, nationwide. Uh, I'm sorry, statewide. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a focus on San Benito, whoops, focus on San Benito County. Um, our uh, case count is about 240 per 100 case. So it was 300 statewide, 240 in the county. So we're doing a little bit better than the rest of the state. And our test positivity is 6.2%. So it's about 1.2% lower than the rest of the state. This is all good. And I think this is all really a direct result of the leadership that the board has shown in terms of supporting us on the, on the measures that we've been uh, doing so, uh, so far. But uh, we do need more cooperation from the public. Uh, it doesn't matter how many rules we put out there, if they're not followed, then um, it's not gonna um, make much difference. So next slide, please. And this is the chart that's again on the state website that shows uh, our, um, our status as far as the monitoring list the threshold for case rate per 100,000 is 100. Uh, we uh, exceeded that on July uh, 3rd and then again on the 5th and eventually we're placed on the monitoring list on the 4th, or I'm sorry, the 6th rather, and, um, and now we're up to 159. So we need to get those numbers down before we can reopen some of our, our um, businesses. Um, and so I'm hoping uh, as we go forward, we'll see that now. Um, actually, uh, would you go to the next slide, please? Uh, this one, uh, this slide, and I apologize, is essentially unreadable. Uh, we'll see if we can get you a better graphic here, but this shows the uh, Optum serve test data, which has been largely consistent. Um, you know, the, the folks that go to Optum serve are supposed to be asymptomatic and are, uh, the number of cases that come out of there tend to be lower than the ones that come out of the testing that happens at the hospital. I think that kind of makes sense. People that are feeling sick go to the hospital and they, they have a higher likelihood of being positive. Uh, next slide, please. So as you know, uh, we're on the county monitoring list and um, all um, county statewide basically had to join us. Um, and this was uh, last week. Uh, that includes the, I think you all know this list, dining restaurants, uh, movie theaters, bars, pubs, breweries, uh, one, one thing I'll point out, and I, I think the state probably had some challenges in distinguishing between a bar that serves food or just a regular bar and a restaurant that serves food and also serves alcohol, and there's no sharp line between the two, but um, they settled on um, a rule that if, um, if a bar does serve food, that it needs to sell the food and the alcohol in the same transaction, meaning that you can't just park a taco truck outside and call it done. And um, I think that was the idea there. And then, um, and then of course, um, we've been under these restrictions for about one week. For the last two weeks, we've been under um, the county monitoring list restrictions of gyms, uh, fitness centers, places of worship, um, offices for non-critical infrastructure, et cetera. Um, actually, I apologize. We've been on the top list for two weeks, the bottom list for one week. Um, the point is, is that um, any of these interventions that happen will not really show up in our numbers for about three weeks after they happen. So we, we may start to see our case counts come down in the next week or two for the top group. And then, uh, and then any effect that the second group or the bottom group had is probably about at least two weeks away at this point. So uh, it makes it difficult. It's hard to uh, drive a car when you, um, when you, uh, hit the brakes and then you have to wait uh, three weeks before the car starts to slow down, but that's the situation we're in. Uh, next slide, please. And then as far as school reopening, um, as, as you know, uh, schools are um, required to do distance learning if um, a county is on the monitoring list. Um, and if a county is not on the list, but they do exceed one of those metrics for one day, 
um, then they also fall into this category. So they don't necessarily have to be on the monitoring list in order to require uh, distance learning. There's certainly some downsides to that, uh, access to internet, access to computers. We know that younger kids benefit from in-person instruction more so than, than perhaps older kids. And there is a waiver um, uh, exception that could be granted to some elementary schools. I received one waiver request so far and uh, I'm reviewing that and then I need to pass that on up to the state and they need to approve it as well. So we may see some elementary schools open depending on um, which superintendents choose to um, ask for that waiver. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, that's it for my presentation. Happy to take any questions from the board. Supervisor Gilliam. Uh, yeah, we had a couple of questions that we forwarded over to Director Belton. Um, the uh, I think I'll defer to Supervisor Medina because I think he has um, has um, probably the same questions I have, but um, a few were addressed in the presentation. And um, Supervisor Medina, do you mind? Sure. Okay. There's a couple of them. The first one, of course, I spoke about earlier was contract tracing. Since we're doing contract tracing, what good becomes of that information if we're not making decisions based upon the outcome? For instance, I had mentioned the salons. Can someone please tell me how, if there wasn't any, why would we have to shut them down? Uh, yeah, thank you. Great question. You know, I uh, I actually happen to believe the salons are fairly low risk. We had there was an outbreak in the Midwest that involved uh, two um, two person two stylists who were infected, and they had a number of customers, and no cases resulted from uh, those uh, interactions, those um, haircuts. And uh, the reason for that is that both parties were wearing a mask. That's the um, uh, the reason why that probably didn't happen. Um, so I was a little bit surprised that the governor had decided to close uh, indoor operations for uh, hair salons. You know, to be honest, with our 448 cases, I don't think we have the resolution to really know if cases came from that, which certainly are a fair number that are, are community transmission where we don't know where they came from. But um, uh, I have asked our um, our public health staff to see if we can tease out some numbers there. We don't have a good sense of that. I think that um, statewide, uh, they were using larger data sets than we have available in San Diego County. Well, then what do we need to do to convince the governor that our salons are operational? We, we should be able to uh, do that. That's why we have hired the uh, public health officer. Certainly. Uh, and. Um, and we do have an opportunity to express our views to uh, the state uh, health officer, Dr. Sonia Angel, and uh, they do often take our considerations in hand. I tell you, um, when I come, if I make a comment regarding our 450 cases and LA has 12,000, uh, you know, they're going to have a stronger voice in terms of, of their data than my data. But um, I, um, I think that's a very good topic for conversation and I'm willing to bring that up to the state to ask them to reconsider that particular sector. Okay. Now, you know, the other one is just dealing with uh, better reporting. When I say better reporting, I have a lot of people asking questions that we need to resolve. And I think the individual that puts the dashboard together would probably be the person to answer these questions. But for instance, on the dashboard itself, when you're speaking of hospitalizations, is that strictly at Hazel Hawkins or is that everywhere? I mean, there's no one seems it seemed at one time they said it was everywhere. And then I did my own little analysis and it it can't be everywhere. If I knew there was two people in the hospital and one was transferred and then it still said Two, two in the hospital because there should have been two in Hazel Hawkins and one somewhere else. So can someone explain that? Maybe Lynn or Mallory? Sure, we report all hospitalizations um, and those include our local hospital and then 
Um, as you know, many of our residents uh, seek health care in surrounding counties, particularly Monterey and Santa Clara County. And so um, if they are hospitalized at Stanford, at Valley Med, or at Salinas Valley Memorial, uh, if they are presently hospitalized and, and uh, we know about it, then it goes onto our dashboard. Okay, perfect. That's what I needed, some clarification. The other uh, clarification is the new cases. New cases are, I have an individual that tests positive on uh, Tuesday. Then that same person wants to go back to work or his, uh, the company has asked him to test again. So he tests again a week later and he's still positive. Does that count as two cases or is it, is it just one case? Well, that's, that's, that's just one case. We do not count the same person who's come back positive more than once as a new case. That's one case. It's one individual. Perfect. And that's vetted through some type of a, uh, social security number or something like that, I take it? It is vetted uh, through a process that we have, yes. Okay. So. That was our epidemiologist. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you, ver thank you very much for that, uh, for that answer. So, you know, one of, the other, one of the other things that I've been hearing a lot is just in general, the testing, some people, there's rumors out there that they are sitting in waiting line and they don't even take the test and they come back positive i mean i know you don't have an answer for that but have you heard anything that can substantiate these uh stories um, yeah uh, i I'm, i haven't really heard those rumors there may be some some uh, rumbling on social media about that but uh, we verify each positive case so we call them to confirm that it's positive. And we've never had a call where we've called someone and they've said, no, I'm not positive. Um, we, we always verify those. I think that we have a 100% verification rate. Okay. Now the last yeah, we're oh, go ahead. Out, We do not report out cases that we don't have a lab confirmation for. Perfect. We don't do positive, no. So they all have to be confirmed cases by a laboratory. So two more questions, and I'll leave you alone. The uh, sure we the, the other the question here is, and you should you might have knowledge of this, but I just want to make sure that everybody out there understands. We have four ICU beds. Is that correct? That is correct. And how many ventilators do we have? I believe we have eight ventilators. Okay, so I just. Want to make sure everybody understands that part. So last is, what do we need to do in order to, after 21 days, what do we need to do in order to open up these salons, these restaurants, and these gyms? What is our goal? Because what I've seen is he moves the goalposts, meaning we get to a certain point, we achieve what we need to do, and then they change the rules. So tw day 21, what? Where do we need to be in order to open up the gyms, the restaurants, and the hair salons? If we can't open up the hair salons tomorrow because we're going to talk to someone today and let them know that we don't have any cases here with uh, salons. But other than that, how can, what do we need to be at? Um, well, I, I think I'm going to let Dr. G answer that question. Dr. G, if you don't mind, yeah. would you like to take that question? Of course. Yeah, we need to get our uh, new case count below 100 per 100,000. 100 per 100,000? 100 and uh, right now we're, yeah, right now we're around 160. Okay. And we've been trending up, but I'm hoping that that starts to come down in the next week or is two. Is that a seven-day lag, or is it a... Uh, yeah, that day? one actually is, uh, let me switch to that slide here. That one is a... 14-day lag. 14-day lag, okay. And how about the positivity? Yeah. I'm sorry, you broke up. Positivity rate, it has to be under, is it 8%? It has to be under 8%. Right now, they're reporting 
on on the site, which is consistent with our numbers. So, um, so basically, uh, both of those numbers need to be below eight. Per, it need to be be below one hundred and eight percent, respectively. Where do you get ten point three when I'm looking at the slide that says six point two test positivity? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I should have pointed it out. I believe that's an aggregate number, the six point two. So that's taking in all of our cases over time. It says the last 14 but, uh, days. If you go to slide uh, six of our um, presentation, slide six shows six. the test positivity rate that they're showing for monitoring uh, for counties on the monitoring list. Okay, I see it now. Yeah. Yeah, see the 10.3 there. Okay, so it's a seven-day lag, not 14. The top one is a 14-day lag. Correct. Okay. So we know the uh, the rules there, and I know you will talk to someone, hopefully, please, about the hair salons, and we'll go from there. But I appreciate everything you're doing. I still believe in the mask ordinance. I stand by you on that, but we need some help from you in order to uh, convince Sacramento that things here might be a little bit different than the entire state, especially looking at our death rate, yeah. which is two. And then you have our hosp hospitalization rate. As numbers have increased, I've been studying this, the hospitalization rate hasn't really increased dramatically to follow that, uh, that bar graph. So my question here is, mm -hmm. is it possible and at what time is the virus slow, not slowing down, but it's not as strong as it was at the beginning. Is that possible? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't quite hear it. Correctly. Okay, so, so I'm looking at the bar graphs. The bar graphs are showing that yes. we have a uh, large increase in daily or weekly new positive cases. But at the same time, when I yes, look right. at this on a daily basis, I do not see a direct correlation with hospitalizations. So even if we're two weeks back, one week back, seven days back, it's, it's irrelevant because I don't see the, tick, the uptick in uh, the hospitalizations. Now, my question here is, being right. that I'm not a medical professional, is it possible that at a certain time the strain or the virus weakens and people now are just self-isolating to stay home and they don't require hospitalization as they did four months ago? Um, you know, I, I don't know of any evidence that the virus itself has changed to the extent that it would cause people to become less ill. Okay. But I do think that uh, the lower hospitalization and death rate uh, as compared to earlier is a reflection of the younger cohort that's getting uh, that's responsible for most of the cases right now. That's the and 57 that we point. expect the hospitalization and death rate to, to trend up um, later. So that's the 57.8 because they're more healthy and they're... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just looking, at, I'm looking at the graph here. It says 57.8 of the cases now are 18 to 49. They're much healthier and they are, I'm not, I can't say for everyone, but they're younger and they can kick the virus much better than anyone else. Is that what you're saying, doctor? Yeah, I think generally speaking, um, you know, we certainly have had um, 18 and 20 year olds die from this virus, but uh, as a group, they tend to be less likely to be hospitalized, more likely to have mild symptoms. Unfortunately, as that reservoir of infected individual grows in the community, the propensity for that to spread to people that are more vulnerable goes way up. And so that's the concern. We think that um, um, the hospitalization and death rates that we expect to come from this won't be directly from these individuals, but from the ones that they pass the virus to later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And then I just wanted to add um, that, of course, there's always a lag time with data. And um, I wanted to add that today we have two uh, COVID 
uh, ICU cases in our hospital, and we have two med surge COVID cases. Uh, so we have four COVID cases today that are hospitalized. Um, this goes up and down. We have a small hospital and we have a small ICU capacity. Um, uh, we don't have anyone on ventilators. Um, and um, we have had uh, someone under the age of 30 in our ICU um, in the last month. Well, thank you very much so for that update. Add the details. Thank you. And I should mention too that uh, Governor Newsom yesterday in his press conference singled out San Benito County as having no ICU beds um, available. And that was actually true the night before last, uh, but not today. So it does change on a daily basis. Well, being... well um, actually, Dr. G, uh, I just got a report. I, I, I'm in touch with um, the hospitals uh, twice a day and um, ICU is full again. Um, but oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, it, it fluctuates daily. Okay. And that, it fluctuates daily because of the uh, amount of ICU beds we have, being we only have four. Yeah, we only have four. And as you know, Supervisor Medina, um, oftentimes when we have a very acutely, or we have a very ill uh, patient, uh, we will fly them out to bigger medical centers. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm completed with my questioning uh supervisor mr chair do you mind coming back to gilio for a second um th this is one one item sure. that one item that medina didn't um cover that we were talking about with tracy was how how do we how do you categorize so it, it, i see i saw a stat recently nationwide that testing has increased 37 percent and infection count has increased 150 percent i don't know um do we have that number for San Benito County? Because one of the uh, one of the concerns that we have is increased testing leads to increased results, right? We've heard that, and obviously, you know, yeah. common sense that you're, you're testing more people, you're going to find out more people have a virus. Do we, do we have um, that number, or, uh, or or can we get that number to put out to the community that hey, we've increased our testing by um, seven hundred percent, and our infections have only gone up, you know, three hundred percent, or vice versa. We've increased twenty percent, and our infections have gone up two hundred percent. Is that something that we have available, or, or is that something you can share later? Um, yeah, I don't have. I think the the testing volume in San Benito County has been relatively consistent. It has not really changed much over the last couple of months. Where where we've got fixed capacity at OptumServe. And then the hospital has um, their their native capacity. I can tell you that California all over, overall has had uh, an increase of about 60% in testing um, volume, uh, but has also seen about a 109% increase in uh, cases. So uh, what's happening is that the the people that are getting tested are more likely to be sick. And uh, that means that the test positivity rate will go up as well. So, um, so yeah, the testing uh, obviously will raise the number of cases, but it doesn't um, have any impact on the disease that's out there. And if you can think of, uh, you know, a tip of an iceberg uh, growing with testing, it's the uh, it doesn't really make sense that the iceberg itself that's underwater is shrinking. So. Um, the testing is just giving us a, a kind of indication of, of disease prevalence. And not causing cases, I guess, is the. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for your patience. I know, uh, Dr. G, this is a lot of questions, but I think it's actually imperative we understand for sure because I'm still a little confused. And I appreciate Supervisor Medina's questions because they kind of hinge along the same lines. Um, I feel like on the dashboard, there needs to be a lot more clarity as far as the beds, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, Lynn mentioned that, that we have some cases that are technically uh, in our hospital, but then some of them are actually considered hospitalizations from out of town in other hospitals. But just, I guess, I would imagine because they're residents of San Diego County, they're considered towards our hospitalization rate. So I feel like the hospitalization needs to be a lot clearer, you know, and I'm curious um, how, mo how many of them are ICU versus non-ICU beds, you know, so it kind of begs to the question of, of uh, if they're there, because of COVID or they're there 
with COVID. Did somehow they get tested after the fact? They're there because they they had a bad injury working on their yard, and uh, and then all of a sudden they get tested. You know what what is the protocol? And then uh, you know what what is that? How do you differentiate whether they're there um, because they had symptoms, right? So maybe are they? If, if if I would imagine with ventilators, it makes it really easy, right? Because that means obviously that the the infection is that bad that uh, they need to be on ventilator. So that makes it clear. But as far as ICU and non ICU. Um, I don't know if there's really clarity on, on interpreting that information. You want to answer that, Dr. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, lots of ways to break down the hospitalization data, and most of this is reported to the state by each hospital. Um, we can work on trying to clarify that on the dashboard a little bit better. Um, I know that ICU beds, um, you know, typically are not occupied unless there's felt to be, um, you know, either a serious illness or the, the potential for a serious illness where you need that one-to-one -one nursing and close monitoring that happens in an ICU. So certainly not everybody in the ICU would be on a ventilator. Um, some are there as a kind of precautionary move. Um, there are um, a number of COVID positive patients that are mildly symptomatic and are sent home. So that just being positive doesn't mean you're hospitalized. But um, the hospitalized group should represent the kind of sicker cohort. Hi, and um, I just want to add that um, those, when they're reported out to us as COVID ICUs, uh, they're in there because COVID is causing some complications. I mean, they're, they're very sick because of COVID. And um, if they're not on a ventilator, it, it's, uh, it, that doesn't mean that they're not receiving some sort of oxygen therapy. Uh, you know, a ventilator is a last resort uh, to help a person breathe when they cannot breathe on their own. Um, and so there are other oxygen therapies and breathing um, treatments that they get in the ICU. The ventilator is really a last resort uh, to help a person breathe. Thank you for that, Lynn and, and Dr. G. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, that makes sense. I appreciate that. I mean, e either way, I think the point is, is it'd be good to to distinguish hospitalizations a bit because there's a lot of assumptions created, you know, they're hospitalized that, you know, if you look at four hospitalizations, you're thinking all of our beds are taken up, but that doesn't necessarily mean the case. And you can interpret that based off, off the surface level information we're getting from the dashboard. Um, and then along those lines, and, and so this is one of the things that I, I'm pretty sure you're, you're hearing about. Uh, I actually sent an article to, to our CAO um, from MSN that basically mentioned that there was folks that were considered positive. They got a letter saying they were positive and they never tested. Somehow they, they were in line. Uh, they weren't, able, they, they weren't able, ever, ever able, able to uh, actually test. Um, they left and somehow they, they got a positive COVID. And then I'm like curious, right? So here I'm trying to understand and I actually went straight to the source to CDC and it defines two different um, situations. One is the positive, which what defines a positive case. So a COVID-19 case includes confirmed and probable cases and deaths. Um, and this change was made to reflect an interim COVID-19 position. So this was uh, back in April 5th. Um, and then when you go, so, so it mentions probable, right? So then you go down to the explanation of what is a COVID-19 probable case. And it says a probable case or death is defined as a person meeting clinical criteria and epidemiologic evidence with no confirmatory laboratory testing performed for COVID-19. So that tells me you didn't necessarily have to get tested and you're still considered a positive COVID case. So then I looked up the breakdown of what clinical cr criteria is and it says basically it's symptomatic, right? At least two of the following symptoms, which is fever, chills, rigors, malaysia. My, myalgia, headache, sore throat. Um, so that's, that's, it's symptomatic is what I'm assuming, you know, I'm always, obviously not a doctor, but that's what it's telling me right now. And then when it mentions uh, epidemiologic uh, linkage, that's someone, that's basically one of the following exposures in the 14 days before onset of symptoms. So it's close contact with a firm, a confirmed or probable case of COVID-19 disease, or close contact with a person with clinically compatible illness linkage to a firm ca confirmed case of COVID-19 disease, travel to or residence in an area with sustained ongoing community transmission. So this has nothing to do with 
testing. This has to do with somehow this person is connected to someone who was maybe considered positive and therefore you by default. So you have to meet both of those criteria. I get it. It's a little bit, uh, maybe it requires a little bit more, but nonetheless, it still excludes, which I think is the, the to me, the confusing, I don't understand why they would do this. Um, the alarming point is you don't necessarily have to have a lab test to be considered a positive case. Uh, and this is through the CDC. So can you explain that to me, doctor? Are we doing that locally or are we da we, we're not following those guidelines? Yeah, I, I believe you're referring, those guidelines go back to early April, I think you mentioned. April 5th. Um, and yeah, those that was a, a time of extreme testing scarcity, and we were really rationing who got tested. So there was a period of time when uh, when everything fit together that you were presumed to be positive. I think that's what you're referring to. Uh, we're not really in that stage at this point. Anybody um, being hospitalized is certainly getting tested. Anybody that goes to the ER uh, yeah, um, you know, obviously the Optum Serve site, um, we're having some access limitations due to volume, but um, but we're not uh, at this stage uh, presuming anybody positive at this point. Now, there may be cases where they've had a close contact, they have symptoms, and we might recommend they just quarantine, and if they wish to get testing, they can, but if we just presume that it's positive in that case, then... Um, then um, you know you sort of treat them as though they were positive, but I'm not aware of any letters we're sending out to tell people that they are positive, unless maybe Lynn could add in. Yeah, and I've seen articles where they actually mention, uh, I think like in Florida, they've actually dropped cases because of that. They've dropped cases that were considered probable, be and they were added as positive cases, and then somehow they got dropped off. Oh, so yeah. So, um, so it just it yeah. just raises the alarming question, right? Because you're dealing with no, ultimately the implications of the public response, uh, which is a, a PR nightmare, right? They're they're assuming certain things. Everybody's panicking, and then all of a sudden you yeah. have. I mean, I've I've personally had business owners reach out to me saying, Peter, I just got attacked right now by a customer because there was someone that was in my shop that didn't have a mask. And they've always been compliant to the rules. They've never in, at all in, in any way, shape, or form yeah. intended to violate the rules, yet somehow they're being attacked because there was one instance where someone walks in without a mask. And that's still not assuming that that person had a, a, a legal reason to not wear a mask, but it still doesn't change mm -hmm. the reality. Is, is this kind of stuff, the clarity is really important because the, the public interpretation and assumptions by default, right, if there's a narrative being created that's damaging to our communities, and that's kind of what I iterated from the beginning, is we have to have a consistent and honest dialogue with the public so that way we make sure we keep our community unified. Um, but nonetheless, uh, so there was, there was one question that I had as far as the under-investigation element. There's, it says there was 82, if I'm not mistaken, in the, and when, you were, when Lynn was showing the dashboard, is, uh, there was 82 under-investigation. Can you clarify what that means? Lynn, would you like that? Uh, sure, I'm actually going to have our epidemiologist speak to this. Sure. Hi, Peter Hernandez. This is Mallory Schmidt. Um, so I just wanted to say that under investigation essentially means that our nurses are still either completing their interviews or I haven't received you know, the data for that. So it's just a lag just because we're in such a surge right now. That, that's what that means, essentially, that we haven't um, designated them to one of those other three categories, that person-to-person, -person, community, or travel-related transmission. Okay. So, and, and it was along those lines, thank you for that answer. Um, it was along those lines of were those, if they're considered, under, if they're under an investigation, does that mean they're probable? If they're probable, are they somehow tallied also with the included positive cases? Uh, again, all the confusion created with, with, with what I shared with you prior um, but, but along that note, so have we ever had a situation in San Mateo County where our probable cases were considered positive? It sounds like, but I don't want to speak for anybody, it sounds like that's true and maybe we've gone away from no, it. No, thank you for that question. Let me address that and get that in the bud there. Um, we do not consider probable, we have no such thing as probable cases necessarily. Um, we require a lab confirmation for a positive result to be considered a case. That is all we use. It's very black and white. Okay. So even if you had a case who was positive and they had contacts, their contacts are not considered probable cases. Okay. So we've never had a probable positive case basically. We we do not use that, no. 
Okay. I just wanted to know, because it sounded like Dr. G mentioned that that was in the beginning, but no longer. So I was just wanted to have clarity on that. So, so locally, locally, it has never been a thing, no. So, and in our numbers, so we can be doing a case investigation. Our nurse can be doing a case investigation and, um, and talking to uh, the lab confirmed case, the person's name that's on that lab confirmed case. So they're talking to that person, they have a positive um, result and then they can, and you know, we talk very intimately with these folks and they can say, well, my son has a fever and my daughter has a fever and my husband has a fever. And so we say, okay, to them in conversation, they need to quarantine and isolate. They need to isolate because they have symptoms. And we consider those as probable cases and we suggest that they get tested if they so choose and when they get those positive results that come in then they are a case but in but as we're doing our investigations probable when we when we come across that kind of a situation and we say oh there's prob there's a probable three cases in this household um those do not go into the numbers until there is a lab confirmed case does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I understand, and, and that makes total sense. I was just asking if historically we've ever done that, like the CDC, because just to clarify, it's on the CDC website today, so that makes it very questionable. Not us locally, right? I'm not saying you guys. I'm saying just in general, right, which agencies are doing this stuff still, if that's the CDC, their, their recommendations for, for itemizing these cases. So, um, and, and, and it makes me curious, like how much of those cases were probable, but they should have dropped off as negatives, uh, and maybe they never did, or, or they or or they were positive and they just recovered, and that's why they dropped. Right? There's all these questions, and that's, they're they're uh, I think they're they're honest and on point, um, but so so uh, uh, and then my, I know I asked prior, and I'm going to ask again, doctor. I know I've uh, um, I know some some public disagrees with me. But I still do believe it'd be a good idea, especially with item 33 coming up, that we put out a health statement to the public, that we make sure that we're not, you know, basically encouraging public policing of, of people, right? I, I see this being the train wreck that's coming personally. Uh, that I, you know, I've I, I seen the report from the health department that it was over 200, 200 uh, instances where folks were basically uh, labeled as, as non-compliant you know, they were, whether it's they, they weren't supporting masks or whatever the assumption was, nonetheless, there's 200 case, 200 instances where someone was basically called and complained. Um, and then num item 33 might even weaponize that element all over, you know, to a certain extent, a heightened degree, because at that point, you're going to have basically folks being fined. And that, you know, if, if, if you have folks that are intent on going after people, uh, item 33, I think, is going to create a, a really strong opportunity for people being attacked. And and uh, and I know the argument is, is well, we got to make sure that there's a process involved. And I get it, but nonetheless, I think it's a good point that we we preemptively tell the public, hey, don't go after people. Uh, there should be, to a certain extent, an ability for someone to defend themselves if, if, like the instance that I mentioned earlier, someone was compliant, was doing a good job, and they were doing their best, not perfect. But uh, if, if you have one individual walk in, you shouldn't be blasted because of that and attacked, and then all of a sudden you're labeled as a bad guy, all because of an assumption that you're really not trying to comply with. There's all these, under, you know, extenuating circumstances that have to be considered, and, and uh, I feel like 33 is going to create an opportunity for more problems than it's going to solve. That's why I don't support it, nonetheless. But um, that's why I, I really think it's a strong opportunity for us to try to unify our community, doctor, and if we put out a statement like that, then we avoid these divisive policing tactics that's already happening right now. Okay, thank you. Yes. Superintendent. Okay. Um, we have had a, a presentation. We have a discussion among the board. Fortunately, we have had no discussion what's on the agenda, and that refers to the adopt urgency ordinance. Uh, in and authorizing civil enforcement, Ray, we like to, yes. or Barbara, yes, bring it back, bring yes, more back to the to the agenda item. Yes, I would like to present that. So, as previously presented by Health and Human Services, 
Um, we're aware of that the COVID virus continues to affect San Benito County and the state of California as well as the nation. Um, the governor uh, has issued um, various executive orders during this COVID crisis um, and the state health department has also issued guidance about businesses that can be open and how businesses must operate. N60-20, which is an executive order, requires that residents obey the guidance that is issued. Um, and I'm just re, uh, re going over the basic points just so the public's aware. Currently, the, the governor's orders can be enforced through criminal sanctions, um, which is 8665, which indicates a violation of an order can be charged as a misdemeanor. In addition, you can enforce the government orders uh, through the, the state of California's orders through civil uh, mechanisms. But there are some negatives with both of those um, mechanics for enforcement. On the criminal level, it should be used for the more serious violations. It may not be appropriate for more minor violations, um, and it, it may be overly harsh for a minor violation to face a, a, a responsible um, person that's never had a criminal citation in their life to have them face a misdemeanor charge. Civil enforcement also takes time and money, um, uh, county resources and a great deal of time to gain enforcement through a civil action such as a temporary restraining order. There's been multiple comments that have been received as a result of the draft ordinance that was placed on the board's agenda. Some of those comments include that there's a lack of established fine schedule, that it may be in, enforced in an inconsistent or arbitrary manner, the sentiment that um, this ordinance will be on the books for forever or for a very long time, even after the urgent need has passed, that this ordinance is just being enacted as a way to create more revenue for the county, or that the maximum fine amount is too excessive. Um, so it raises the basic question about what fine amount encourages compliance without being too high or unreasonable or unreasonably punitive. Um, staff is presenting a revised fine schedule, which would have the maximum non-commercial um, fine of $200 and the maximum commercial related violation of $750. I bear, uh, ask the, bear, the board to bear, um, uh, to, uh, it's gonna take some time to go over some of the staff recommended changes, but I would like to read them into the record as far as what staff would like to propose to. To, to address some of the concerns that have been raised. The changes in the fine amount make our proposed ordinance more consistent with the city of Salinas and the city of Monterey. The city of Monterey has a face covering ordinance um, and the city of Salinas, which do not have uh, fines that were as high as our initial proposed ordinance. And I also wanna reiterate that you cannot be fined unless the enforcing officer verifies the uh, the violation. It's not that you will receive a fine if a neighbor reports a violation if it hasn't been independently confirmed by the enforcing officer. So the first change is going to be in section three, which is adding a definition of commercial. It says commercial means relating to business or business activity, including but not limited to making or intending to make a profit. Paragraph F of definitions has been modified to re reduce the number of parties that can actually enforce this ordinance to a more small group of select individuals that have um, experience with enforcement. So it says now enforcement officer means any peace officer, the environmental health manager or his or her designee, and any code enforcement officer from the division of code enforcement and the resource management agency, comma, and anyone identified by resolution of the board. Does, skipping, does the report part of pardon? No, no, skipping down to section seven. Okay. Section seven now will read entire, entirely section seven A reads an enforcement officer may issue a citation to any responsible party violating any provision of this ordinance no penalty shall be assessed until the factual basis for the citation has been verified by the enforcement officer. So that other sentence that was originally in that sentence has been deleted. The section regarding penalties shall read in full, penalties 
in parentheses, fines for administrative citations issued pursuant to this ordinance shall be as follows. Non-commercial. The civil penalty for each non-commercial violation shall be a fine not to exceed the following. First offense, written warning. Second offense, $75. Third offense, $125. Fourth and subsequent offenses, $200. Commercial. The civil penalty, paragraph one. The civil penalty for each commercial violation shall be a fine not to exceed the following. First offense, written warning. Second offense, $150. Third offense, $350, and fourth and subsequent offenses, $750. Any revenue, the, the next sentence, which was originally number two, which had referenced a $10,000 fine maximum, has been deleted. Um, the following language has been added at the end of the, that section. It says, any revenue derived, or, I'm sorry, any revenue rem, received from administrative citations greater than the cost of enforcement shall be set aside in a dedicated fund to be used as determined by the Board of Supervisors for COVID-related expenses such as grants to businesses and nonprofits. Then we skip down to Section 10, the last sentence in Section 10 has been deleted because it was moved up to Section 7. And in paragraph section 14, there was a sentence added at the end. In addition, this ordinance shall have no further force and effect if the board does not adopt a resolution every 45 days supporting continuation of enforcement through a program including administrative citations. If adoption of such a resolution does not occur, this ordinance expires 45 days after the last adopted resolution. And those are the, the changes I think that that will make an ordinance that will encourage compliance without being unreasonably or uh, punitive or un, uh, and the goal of this ordinance is not to come down too hard uh, not to be unreasonable in the enforcement but to encourage enforcement for the greater um, health of the public and to incur uh, encourage uh, compliance um, i am available for any questions if you would like and i could read the ordinance of the title of the ordinance for the record right now, an urgency ordinance of the Board of Supervisors of the County of San Benito, incorporating by reference and authorizing administrative penalties and civil enforcement of State of California and San Benito County Public Health Officer COVID-19 emergency orders. Thank you, Barbara. In the, in the interest of time, uh, we had a, it's a discussion earlier with the doctor and the staff about how we felt or our opinions and asking technical questions about the numbers and all that. For the next X minutes, let's stay focused on the presentation that Barba made. Any questions to Barba? Mr. Chair, this is Jim Gillio. Yes, sir. I, I was just wondering um, if you thought it would be appropriate because there was a lot of changes to the um, to the ordinance that Barba just read. Um, and those were based off of uh, a lot of the feedback that I had received. Um, maybe we could have public comment now, if that's appropriate, and then bring it back to the board. I just wanted to throw that out there for you because it's a lot to digest as we are in a meeting here and, and there's a lot of uh, changes. Um, I think it's definitely more, uh, I used the term before, uh, cleaver versus scalpel, and, and this, this is more of a fine fine point. We had vast amounts of swing between a, a, a low violation of, you know, a uh, hundred or $250 up to $10,000 for businesses. And that's all changed. So we've got a sunset ordinance in there. So it doesn't stay on the books forever. The revenue doesn't go straight to the general fund. It's not a, a, a way to, for the County to quote unquote, raise revenue, uh, a bunch of different changes, but I'd like to hear um, public comment on that. And that's just one supervisor. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, Supervisor Peter, Supervisor Hernandez. Yeah, uh, just two points before it goes to the public uh, that I didn't hear, and I think it'd be good for the discourse of even the public, is uh, I think I brought it up before to, to County Council, to Barbara, but one is the due process for the defendant, uh, making sure that there's actually a court proceeding and not a hearing. You know, it's one thing, for, I just, I don't, I wouldn't want anybody to be outside of the public conversation to understand, uh, to a certain extent, these folks need to be able to defend themselves. Um, and this is you know, still outside of me supporting it, but nonetheless, this is just my, my concerns is, you know, uh, and then the other part of it is, is uh, you know, the constitutional right of the public to be able to confront their accuser, right? I mean, I've, 
there's, I know for me personally, there's been instances I'd be really frustrated as an example where someone's complaining about my dog and it's like my dog is never out and the one time they're out, all of a sudden I get a, I get a, a police officer showing up to my door or a code enforcement officer showing up and complaining and saying what, and, and it had nothing to do with, with reality, it had more to do with just someone, yeah, it was, it was a retaliation element. So, um, so, and I know that County Council did mention that while well, you gotta protect the right of the public, right, uh, uh, that, that are calling in, right, um, kind of like a whistleblower thing, but to a certain extent there's gotta be a, a protection both ways. Right, I agree with that. I think the public has a right to, to file a complaint, but I also have, I believe that there's a right for the, the defendant to be able to know who's accusing them so they would try to, to a certain extent, um, be able to present a case for themselves um, and, and have more factual evidence into the conversation so that it's relative, right? Because if there's instances where someone knows that they've, they've got into an argument with somebody and then all of a sudden it's, they go after them, then it's like, it's a lot easier to understand why someone would go after you, not because of, of you trying to violate any rules, but just they don't like you, right? It, it becomes a biased thing and I want to avoid that. But you're not going to have that ability if the defendant can't protect himself just as much as the offender uh, uh, or the, 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 one, the, the, the complaint uh, person would, would have the right to, to uh, file that complaint. I can address that. Um, no citation shall occur unless the violation has been verified by the effect uh, enforcing officer. And that person is going to be the one that wit witnesses the complaint and actually is going to be the person that is, um, will be at the administrative um, hearing. So let's say that neighbor complains that there's a party going on in the backyard or maybe a business is open. It's not that neighbor that's actually bringing the complaint it's actually going to be the enforcing officer that shows up and notices that that business is open okay so the names of the the neighbors that make the complaint would remain confidential under this ordinance there's a section of that but the due process is still there because it's actually the enforcing officer that's bringing the complaint saying i saw the business being open and the person has the right to confront that enforcing officer we do have, and I, I understand that there's maybe differences of opinion on that, um, but it's customary throughout the state to, um, from past, resource, past research when we've had Public Records Act requests for the names of people that do code enforcement complaints, a lot of jurisdictions do keep the name of somebody that files a code enforcement complaint confidential so that there's not retaliation about, against the person that's made the initial complaint. And we do have an independent hearing officer. It's not somebody that it's not going to necessarily it's not going to be an employee of the county yeah, but, but, yeah it's going to be a professional Barbara, hearing an, officer that that feels free to rule against the county if that's, uh, that's an unfair yeah. statement though because ultimately you're basically saying you can f you can file a complaint in retaliatory opportunities but the defendant doesn't have the, the right to defend themselves when someone's reta retaliation doesn't just happen one way it's very possible and plausible. I mean, that, well, there, let's put it this way. There's a reason why the Constitution allows for you to be able to uh, confront your accuser because there's a lot of excluded evidence in that decision-making process that doesn't give the person the right to truly basically frame the argument as, as to why that would be retaliatory versus non-retaliatory. So it puts, it, it puts the defendant in a lot tougher position than the complainant. The person that complains can walk away scot-free, not worrying about whether they're just crushed a business, whether they just crushed an individual. You know, it, they don't, it doesn't matter. And I don't think that's right. There's a reason why it's in the Constitution for you to be able to confront your accuser. And I, don't, I, I completely disagree with that. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, any other supervisor would like to speak before I open up to the public? Yeah, brief, briefly, Mr. Chair, uh, addressing that. So... The, the, in the original um, version of the ordinance, there was some ambiguity about who could call in and who, how, how, a, how a citation could be issued or how, a, uh, how, how it could happen. And that, that, the whole purpose of that is, is to, 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 to not have that situation that Supervisor Hernandez is concerned about. And that was a concern that I raised to county council as well as my prior uh, law enforcement experience. The, um, it's, it's very critical that a, um, so in, in the criminal law, the way it works is, is a, a citizen cannot make a misdemeanor arrest for an infraction. They can only make a, a misdemeanor citizen's arrest for a um, felony that occurred in their um, presence and then also some other very limited amount of misdemeanors. So the whole thought was to make sure that the person who is issuing the citation is, is witnessing the actual 
violation in real time as it's happening and there's not a hey um you know my neighbor uh, supervisor hernandez the other day had uh, 17 people um at his um you know um, party at the vets hall and you know whatever whatever the violation was that 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 well, wouldn't that do, doesn't matter they can call in and say well you know the the, the answer I, I think the response in the super in the um, supervision and the people taking those calls would be well that happened in the past and there's no way we can verify that that's it that's the end of the story so somebody has to go out physically vis visually see it and this is there, there's a similar phenomenon right now uh, with and I, I, obviously, I don't want to compare the seriousness of fireworks and, and COVID and all those things, but just in the, the pure law, lawful mechanics of it, you know, administrative citations have become very commonplace over the last several years with, with fireworks violations. And you always have the right to go to a hearing officer, confront your accuser, who is the person who wrote you the citation, whether that be a police officer. Um, and that, that happens frequently, right? And, and, um, those administrative citations. The whole thought behind behind this, uh, frankly, you know, after talking with the sheriff, um, I did not talk directly with the DA, but I heard secondhand from the DA through the sheriff that they're, they're looking for something outside of the criminal justice system. They're looking for something administrative that can be handled outside of the criminal justice system. Number one, like uh, county council said, no, nobody wants, I don't believe any board member, no, nobody up here, no, no county team members wanna, um, get somebody involved in the criminal justice system over over COVID. That, that's that's the whole I think consensus of why they're they're looking at this is because now you have an, an administrative and again it says in their written warning, not not a verbal warning, because then you have the allegations of well, um, I, I uh, we already gave you a warning. No, you didn't. You know, it's a it's a physical written warning. You'll ha you'll have a piece of paper, and the the hearing officer would have that piece of paper with the citation. So it's a two step process there. So I, th I think a lot of that's been thought of, and and I, I just hope that um, I, I I totally I, I got a ton of calls on this on the weekend, but both on both sides of this, um, we went back to county council with all the feedback that I received from people. And and don't get me wrong, I don't want to misrepresent the calls. I, I also got several calls that said absolutely not, this is ridiculous. Don't don't do this. So let's be clear, those calls are out there as well. However, um, with the calls that I got that said, hey, you know, you should consider this because this doesn't look right with the um, with the with the uh, amount of the fines, the the sunset ordinance. How long does this thing stay on the books? Where does the money go? You're just doing it to raise money for the county. Uh, all of those issues were addressed in the statement that um, county council made, and I just wanted to make that clear. And then also, um, if anybody um, from the sheriff's office wanted to make any comments, I'm not putting anybody on the spot. If they do want to make comments, that's great. And if they don't, that, that's great as well. And um, that, those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, it's Mark Thank Medina. You. Thank you. Actually, um, I got Supervisor Batello. Sorry, okay. Mark, I'll go after you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, <laughs> One of the things we've been talking about for for several weeks at the uh, roadmap to recovery with the two cities is that we have to have some sort sort of enforcement uh, abilities. I don't think the two cities want to be punitive or, and go out there and actively, you know, try to cite people. Um, certainly not the businesses, but we have to have a tool in place that if there is some, you know, real negligence, uh, that um, we could enforce our ordinances and, and the state's orders. This is coming from the state. We have to have this. And um, at least this capability to, you know, be, you know, have the incentive for people to follow the, the guidelines and, and the governor's orders. And I, I don't think it was made too clear that you know, this, and maybe Barbara could clear this up a little bit. This is for the unincorporated areas. The cities are passed their own ordinance and their own enforcement. Um, and, and I think that's something we uh, have to keep in mind as well. Yes, that is correct. If right. I could clarify, this is for the unincorporated county. The city will be looking, the cities will be looking at their own enforcement mechanisms. It's for the unincorporated area of the county, this ordinance. Supervisor Martina. Yes, I'd, I'd like to be clear on something. It's, uh, 
looking at this ordinance, the only way I would even consider it is if this is for face mask only with individuals. We're we're not speaking of someone uh, calling someone and saying, "Hey, there's ten people in my backyard." This is strictly a face mask this for individuals this should be a face mask only um, and i do look at other different states other cities that have it for face masks and face masks only and that's that's kind of how i look at it um yeah it's at the discretion of the board some cities have done face masks only currently it's uh would also cover um, businesses that are open contrary to the guidance is I'm talking are. about individuals Barbara okay it's individuals it's face mask only okay that's that's what I'm concentrating on right now it's individuals if we could get a polling from the board about whether they would like that change I can draft language if the board as a whole would like that Barbara what does it say right now maybe hear from the public yeah pardon Supervisor De La Cruz <laughs> Yes, what does it say right now? Is it say it's for any um currently um for individuals uh it would be any individual that violates any of the guidances that are issued by the state. So it could be um guidances other than just uh um face coverings. So it could include issues like gatherings even if they were non-commercial in nature so like what supervisor, supervisor medina is saying that it's only face covering but if there's a backyard party of say 20 people then they can't issue a citation on that is that correct supervisor medina yes i mean the the governor states himself that uh, you can't have protests and that's my problem that i have is it's hard for me to say that you can go protest and have many people involved in this, but when it comes to something that you know your neighbor has, I just I just don't I can't buy it where one thing is good and the other thing's not. So that's why I'm looking at face mask in public, and that that would be only for the individuals. I don't know if I can support that because uh, I noticed that, and I guess. Doctor, help me out here. I noticed that a lot of the latest cases are young people who meet in more than 10 gatherings or even family gatherings. In fact, I even had a relative that tried to throw a party at a backyard and I told the person, no, 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 don't you go there. So I don't know if I can support your position, Mr. Um, Supervisor Medina, and I'm not going to support it. Supervisor Batello? No? Okay. Uh, Supervisor Jim Gilliam? Just what, what are the states, uh, before we go to public, what, what are the states' gui guidance uh, right now if we have a HHS online still regarding public gatherings, um, you know, private public gatherings like a backyard barbecue? I, I thought that fell off the radar, but maybe, um, maybe I'm wrong. Good question. Is that, I'm sorry, is that question for me? Or somebody at, <laughs> yeah, or somebody over oh, in your office. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, my apologies. Uh, yeah, my understanding is that um, any gatherings of households uh, coming together uh, is still uh, not allowed. Um, whether there's enforcement behind that is another question, but that's where a lot of cases have come from is family gatherings, people from dis yeah. different households coming together. Thank you. Okay. Can we can we open up to the public? Okay, we're gonna open up to the public. Can Michelle? I and I, I I have her name down here. Michelle, would you like to speak up first? She's not on the on the call list. Mr. Chair, we have somebody in the chambers that would like to speak. We'll start there. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Good 
Good morning. Um, yes, sir. I'm not sure where to start. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, less than three quarters of 1% have tested positive in our county in the last four months, and they're not all sick. Um, although for the last 10 days, um, recently, um, 10 a day uh, have been detected um, over the last 20 days. Uh, if at a rate of 10 a day for the next two weeks, we'll get to 1% of our population. Um, in order to get to 5%, we'd have to have 10 a day for nine months. Um, that's 5% of our population um, tested positive, not necessarily sick. Um, you know, I mean, I can comment that it seems like it's a lot worse since we've had mandatory masks. Is that a direct correlation? I don't know. Um, I don't know if the author to the ordinance is here, um, but on page 11 it says, significant and escalating numbers of suspected cases of community transmission at large events. So what are large events and what is suspected and where is the evidence? Can they share evidence with us that they suspect this is where all this hell and damnation is coming from? Um, I'd like you to remember that ordinance can be used to harass citizens as well as businesses. Um, watch out what you do. You know, looking out for us. Um, uh, please consider our community is in a good position. We don't necessarily have to listen to Dr. Q. He's not a statistician. He's trying to keep people healthy, but he doesn't know all the laws. That's why you people are here. I, I just Im implore you to open schools, churches, gyms, indoor restaurants. Please take control of our county. You don't necessarily have to follow the governor in order to get money. That's extortion, okay? Now our businesses are going to have to go to you to get money to keep them going. That's extortion too. Let people stay open and let's have proof that you got it at the Heritage. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Uh, chamber speaker, Mr. Chair. Hey, my name yes. is Victoria Montoya and I'm here just to ask a question. Is that all these testing that's going in the county does the community know where, how long it's going to be here, and who can go, how can you get there? Because I, I come from District 5, which most of us, if we don't go to the clinic that's nearby us, we don't know where to go testing and how often should you do it. So I just want to know how long is this testing that's at the Veterans Building going to last so we can go at least you know, every three months or whenever you feel like you need to. So I just want to know that. Thank you, Vicki. We'll have a response for you. Uh, uh, make sure that you send your information to Ray and he'll respond to your question. Thank you. Next speaker. Kevin, if you could please state your name. Hi, it's Kevin Stopper. I'm not sure if uh, this is the right time to ask a question of the HHS. Is that appropriate yes sir okay um i just had a question on the timing of the uh results um it kind of relates to what's going on i uh it took me i had to make some travel uh during the fourth of july week and i came back and i wanted to get tested it took me almost seven days to schedule and when i finally got scheduled i'm still waiting for my results and it's been six days now um, 
the reason I did that is because I did travel and I did have an accident while I was traveling, which involved blood and involved going to an ER up in Portland. And I was uh, thankfully uh, helped by a unknown citizen who had to apply pressure to my wound. Uh, so I was exposed by an unknown person. Um, but beyond that, <clears throat> um, I'm still waiting for my results. And I think in relation to that, I think um, that that trickles down to the businesses that also have to wait. Um, I think that has to be taken into consideration. When those, when those results are waiting, we're also getting those results that are waiting, uh, being reported. So do those businesses also have to wait for those results? That's kind of my question. And I'm wondering if that's, if there's a seven day wait for my uh, results, do those results also get uh, reported seven days later? And then those businesses have to wait another, you know, those seven days to open up. You understand what I'm asking? That's it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ray, can you get name and information and try to help him out on getting him an update on his test? Yeah, well then. Thank you. Next speaker. If you could please state your name for the record. You have been unmuted. If you could please unmute yourself. I'm going to go to the next speaker. Hello? Yes, madam. This is Jackie Morris Lopez, uh, resident yes. of San Juan Batista. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, because I'm on my speakerphone in my car, and I've waited a long time to make a comment, and I actually am now a little confused because Supervisor Hernandez went on a very long tirade and tangent and circled back to that question he asked at a meeting a few weeks ago to our public health officer. Could you please stand up and make a statement about please don't bully the anti-maskers, which I think is a ludicrous and ridiculous stance and a question to throw at our public health officer. I just want to state that. Also on the record, just as you give us the citizens three minute limit, there should be a limit, a reasonable limit on you, Board of Supervisors, primarily Supervisor Hernandez. He talks incessantly and gets off target and off tangent, and it just makes it for a very long meeting. And I'm parked outside of my workplace, but it's important for me to state this. I don't think we would be going down this road of an ordinance if the public respected that this is a public health issue. COVID is a public health issue. It should not be a police issue. If everyone did their part and wore a mask and social distance and took common sense as to what businesses are essential and which are not, we wouldn't be in this position today, looking at it as a law, as an ordinance, who's gonna police it, who's gonna ticket it, where's the money? You know, I think that you have an arm already of the public health department. You have environmental health, you have the officer that goes around and checks on restaurants and businesses to see that they're following code. Why can't you have an arm of that division to make sure that these same businesses often are opened that follow the COVID guidelines? And last thing I want to say, and I'm, put, I'm pointing this out specifically to Supervisor Patello, he's from my district, is once again, I think it's really ludicrous that the San Juan merchants have approved and the city council to open up bars that serve dinner. You're either a bar or you're not. And I feel, like I said earlier, that mixing alcohol and food together in the guise of this is okay, we can do this because it's food, you're, that's like a very risky situation. You're having people drink without a mask on. The guideline is to wear a mask when you're not chewing food or drinking a beverage. You throw alcohol into the mix and what do you think is gonna happen? Thank you very much for your time and Supervisor Gilio, good luck to you. I get a good sense that you're a good guy, you're a thinker, and good luck to you in your future. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, 
All right, next speaker. Patty, if you could please state your name. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Patty Spears, and I'm a resident of San Benito County. I've read the proposed emergency ordinance regarding enforcement of penalties and civil enforcement under the guise of COVID-19. I found it very disturbing for the following reasons. I'll try and be as brief as possible. Section three, one, um, line one, section two, any person or entity that owns r any real property equaling landlords are at risk of having their properties taken from them due to the actions of the tenants, which the landlord has no legal grounds to control. Section 11 basically allows the county to seize real property under the blanket of violation enforcement. This is in violation of the Fifth Amendment. And I, I can read the Fifth Amendment if you need to know what that is. Next section four, government code 53069.4 shall constitute a public nuisance, yet the marijuana grow that took place on Union and Riverside was not shut down. I felt that was a public nuisance and I know for a fact there were many complaints about that. Section five, sec, um, line B, powers of enforcement officer would have the power to inspect public and private property, which equals an invasion of privacy and is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. At what point is somebody allowed to come into my home? That's absolutely not allowable. It's just not acceptable. Section five, um, number C, person can be fined. I understand that the fines are being uh, fine-tuned, for lack of a better term, but being fined $1,000 for willfully resisting, delaying, or obstructing any enforcement. What constitutes resisting, delaying, et cetera? It, it basically is a loss of rights if you do not comply. Section six, um, part B, allows immunity for the county and any enforcement office, officer for their actions and violations of a person's freedom. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not tuned to that. Yeah. Section seven, line B, section one, civilian violations anywhere from $2,500 to $500 occurrence. When people are out of work, they have 30 days to pay it. This is not what your constituents need during this time of crisis. Further, uh, here we go. Uh, section, same section, item two, commercial fines for, is, which is another attack on the businesses in this county. Our supervisor just resigned over the need to keep his business open, yet ordinances like this would do the exact opposite and cause nothing but further harm to businesses. The fees, another way for the county, this was brought up, another way for the county to um, create revenues essentially equal to a tax, therefore creates an incentive to fine citizens. Uh, you did mention, oh, well, unpaid fees lead to jail time because jail time is mentioned several times within this ordinance. So. Does this lead to jail time? Next thing, appeals process. All. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I. Next speaker. Hunter, if you could please state your name. Hunter Cunio, resident of San Benito County. Yes, sir. Uh, I can speak to this issue personally. I had some experience with it just last week. Uh, hours after being messaged by a bunch of low lives telling me they're going to have my white privileged business shut down. I was visited by an employee of Four Leaf Incorporated, which is a company contracted by San Benito County to handle code, code enforcement. He came and took pictures of my residence and my private property that I lease in Trespinos. I have to explain to my children why a man is outside of our house taking pictures of us. Thanks to this snitch line, you're activating this law has been placed in the hands of the most spiteful, hateful lowlives who at any time can now use code enforcement or law enforcement to come and harass or investigate anyone who they don't like for any reason. Someone can have a grudge with you from high school and now you can get code enforcement out to your property because you weren't wearing your damn mask properly. It's enough. I'm telling you, I've had enough. My wife and children have had enough. It has nothing to do with public health. The fatality rate in our county falls exponentially every day right now. And if it were truly about public health, our health officials would have mentioned by now something everyone can do to slow this spread, and that's take responsibility for your own damn health. There's been no mention of exercise, good nutrition habits, and the things you can do to make yourself harder to kill rather than just hiding behind a germ-infested mask or hiding away in your home. 
Instead of spending the last four months worrying about who's wearing a mask or calling snitch lines, some of you people could have dropped a few pounds and by now have reversed the underlying conditions that are the real cause of hospitals filling up. We are in a psychological war and I am not okay with this. You think you're gonna get a relief with a vaccine? Well, what about the next virus? People's minds are broken now and kids are not gonna have the opportunities or freedom that the, the, the majority of people are okay with this. I can't get that. Target, Walmart, Amazon recording record profits while small businesses are being destroyed. Politically approved businesses are deemed essential by McDonald's and stoner shops. Anything that keeps you fat and dumb is approved. Yet if it's something that actually sharpens your mind and body, it's seen as a threat to public health. And of course, churches, the biggest threat in this culture war. I've always treated our local officials with respect and I've had conversations with all of you, always willing to talk respectfully and you guys know that. But going forward, anyone comes onto my private property uninvited, they will be treated and dealt with as trespassers. Let me ask you, if these people who are threatening me, calling me in the middle of the night, telling me they're driving by my place and know where I am, if one of them, God forbid, happens to harm me, my children, or anyone else who's been exercising their First Amendment rights, will you then defy the lying governor? Thank you. Next speaker. If you could please state your Hi, name. Hi, my name is Michelle from Salon 218. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so like I was saying before, and now that I've listened to a lot of the different things that you guys have been talking about, one thing that's extremely clear to me right now is that uh, people do not even understand how businesses work. If you've never owned your own business, you don't understand. So here we are running our businesses, and we're trying to, and people from the outside sources are trying to control our businesses with fines and all different things, telling us we can't work, we can't make a living for our family. It's actually absolutely ridiculous. When I opened my salon, I opened it with guidelines. The guidelines that were set in, for, in, uh, in place by the county health department and by the governor. And then we actually added more um, guidelines to it because they didn't really meet the standards of what we needed in a salon. So when I opened, we opened with masks, distancing, sanitation, servicing less than normal amounts of customers. We followed the guidelines of our health and county department the governor of California, and if that's not enough, we went over the top trying to do our part to keep our customers safe. In our salon alone, for the first month, we asked our guests the night before a series of COVID questions. Then when they arrived to the salon, they had to wait in their car, text us, let us know that they were there, and then they would have to wait until we were ready. When they came to the door, we would take their temperature before they would enter. No purses, no jackets, all keys, phones, and small items would be placed in a Ziploc bag. Their, their service would be done and they would be quickly sent out the door. Any cash or checks had to be put in plastic bags before they would arrive and all the other payments would be done on other platforms after they left. No blow dryers, just out, of, out the door. Then we would reschedule their appointment on the phone while they were sitting in their car before they drove away. Am I missing something? I don't understand. We were doing every single thing they told us to do. We went over the top. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't make any sense to me as a business owner why we can't do business. We were doing it. It was working. People were coming in. And now they're asking us to do ridiculous things like going outside and doing something in a tent, taking our equipment outside every single day. If you can't grasp how ludicrous this, this sounds, I don't even know how to explain it. I'm just over the top embarrassed that people would even um, – ask us to do something like that. I know people do it in parks. They do it in different settings. That's different. But when it's your job and you're, and you're asking for money, it's different. You want to provide something that's healthy, that's safe, that's ab absolutely the best for your clients. It's not a contribution. This is not an event where we're doing people's hair for free on the side. This is our job. Let us do our job. And in, in the Constitution and... Um, Article 5, Clause 2 in the Constitution, it says that the supreme law, that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, thus takes priority over any conflicting state laws. So as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter. If you could please state your name for the record. Jennifer Kelly. Go ahead. 
Um, I just wanted to say that it's hard enough during all of this um, coronavirus and all these mandates just to keep your head above water. And like so many of the people that have businesses here, they're having a hard time and people are personally having a hard time. I don't understand why with our numbers as low as they are. I mean, I understand there's some people that can get sick, but with our numbers as low as they are, why are we hurting people by adding more and more laws? I mean, if, if I want to see my adult children and they come over for dinner and I can get fined for that, that's insane. But people can be out on the street and protesting. It's just crazy. I don't understand why we're making more and more laws to hurt people. If you're worried about getting sick, stay home. Let the rest of us survive and make a living and see our children. I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I hope that nobody votes on this um, rule to fine people for having someone over to their house. It's just ridiculous. That's it. Courtney, if you could please state your name. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Courtney Evans. I own Kamal Yoga Studio. My address is 401 McRae Street. I would like everyone to look up evidence-based mental health. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we feel, how we act. It determines how we handle stress. Mental health is important at every stage of life from childhood, adolescence, through adulthood. This is a rights issue. Human autonomy ought to be respected for its own sake. I'd like to read something from San Benito County Behavioral Health one day ago. We understand that COVID pandemic has caused an increase in stress and mental health concerns. We want you to know you're not alone. Many others feel this way and are reaching out for help. Guess what? The government isn't the only help. I believe in helping each other, helping my community. Integrated yoga therapy for mental illness has a calming effect, increasing awareness, increasing attention span, acceptance and adaptability, a sense of security. People don't come to my business because they're forced or threatened or paid. It is a choice. I have been attacked. I quote, I wish Indians never showed white bitches yoga. I quote, I'm going to need Courtney Evans in jail, ASAP. This ordinance gives anybody any right to call and then I am treated like a criminal. I am treated like a criminal. I cannot face my accuser. I will stand up for my business my community, my rights. I will stand in the court of law and I will face this head on. My business is proudly open for people to use it as they see fit for their mental health without explanation, without question. I have a private clean facility that you must fill out and make an appointment to come to. I will not stand for threats I will not stand for the removal of my right, and I will continue to choose to support my family as I support this community and their choice for health. We have choices other than the Behavior Health Department, and they need support too. This is ridiculous. I agree with all of my business owners that have been on this call before. I ask you to stand for the Constitution, human and health rights and freedoms. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Jessa, if you could please state your name. This is Jessa Fraser. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm a resident of Hollister, and I am absolutely appalled that this could even arise on, on a supervisor. Oh, my goodness. I am absolutely appalled that this could even arise as something you would vote on. I asked over a month ago, almost two months ago, what is your end date? What is the actual end date at which you will stop restricting businesses? 
because this could go on forever. We have no end date in sight, not from the federal government, not from the state government. There is no guaranteed cure. All there is is mitigation and dealing with this. It is now in our society and our county, our city and our county will never be able to stop it because it will come back in and back and back. If there is a, a vaccine in the future and people are able to get some help with that, great. But in the meantime, we've got to learn to live with it. So I ask again, 45 days, then another 45, then it's voted on for another 45. The snitch line so that neighbors are turning on each other is absolutely horrifying to me. If you have studied history and you know the French Revolution had something very similar where all you had to say was, I denounce you to a neighbor, a colleague, a coworker, anyone in the community you disliked for no reason at all. I denounce you and they were taken off. And I understand that you feel it is nowhere near that. But the problem is once you violated the rights, what makes the next step preventable? Every day people are healing from this virus. It is a big concern. I am concerned for both my parents who are in danger with, with um, pre-existing conditions and, and age. But the idea that I can't visit my own parents to check on them or bring them groceries, which is safer for them to be tucked away in their home for this time without getting violation calls from an officer is really, really wrong. Absolutely wrong. Our churches have been closed back down, even to outdoor services. That makes no sense at all. The governor is now being sued as of this week by multiple churches for his hypocritical behavior to encourage and stand with thousands and thousands of protesters that he said had the right to do that, you know, to exercise their First Amendment right. But those of us who want to exercise our constitutional rights to gather to pray with another friend in our home or to go to an outdoor church service with mitigation and separation and social distancing are being punished. Do not stand with this governor. You will be liable for lawsuits as well. The violation of our church constitutional rights, of our property rights is unreal. And I beg you to think this through. It will not solve the problem. If it would solve the problem, it would still be wrong, but it won't because it will keep coming back. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker, please. Madonna, if you could please state your name. This is Adana, county resident, San Benito. You can hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, please, before you start my time? Thank you. Um, this, you guys made really, really excellent point, and I want to thank Ms. Spears for her points about all the things that are wrong with this order. It is a complete and total violation of our constitutional rights. From, from the first to the 10th amendment, believe me. Um, I thank God for the county sheriff. He is sworn to uphold the constitution and he answers to the people. And we have to, we have to make sure and support our sheriff because he cannot, um, he will be called on to enforce this and he does not have to. And I hope that that is his position. Um, I have to tell you guys, uh, the governor is not a king. He cannot order anybody to do anything. He's only getting away with this stuff because he has little brown shirts. And that is a Hitlerian reference. He's acting like Hitler telling his people what to do and ordering them about. And the brown shirts are carrying it out. He has no authority to carry it out. He needs the local counties to put these kinds of ordinances in place. Um, the um, public supporting of the public policing and a violation of our um, rights and not being allowed to face our accusers. It's already happening. I just sent you guys some stuff that I saw there. You're really ruining this community um, to put this in place. It's not gonna help anybody at all. And I have to say, the whole irony about this is, this isn't even about the flu. It's not about the flu anymore, people. In any given year, we have 20 million to 80 million cases of flu in our country alone, with the same people being susceptible and the same loss of life. And we have one of those flus now. And ironically, we only have 15 million cases worldwide and 4 million in our country when typically we get 20 million to 80 million. You guys, something is not right here. And the rest, your constituents and the people out here 
they think that this is crazy. It's like listening to a Saturday Night Live skit who you guys talk about the numbers and the testings and the dashboard and the this and the that and the math. The flu is going to work its way through the population. That's what flus do. And we have actually inhibited it. It should have been done by now. With these stupid masks and the stay-at-home orders, people were willing to give you two weeks, then four weeks. And now it's just going to go into the next flu season, and we're going to keep hearing about the numbers and, and why we have to wear masks. And we can't go out until small businesses are dead, and we are completely under the thumb of the government. I urge you to vote no against this ordinance that is flawed in every way. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker, please. Ashley, if you could please state your name. Hi, good morning. My name is Ashley. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Great. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to call in. Um, I just simply want to say and reiterate what everyone else has been saying. Um, I actually host at different businesses that have allowed me to um, a nonprofit mental health for first responders. Um, I just want to speak to the fact that I feel that protests are allowed that different things are allowed throughout our county. And, and yet we are unable to, as a private citizen or nonprofit, gather at either my personal home or any of the businesses that I have been utilizing that have received cease and desist orders. Um, I just feel like we need to provide our first responders, our mental health, we need to really um, utilize them, help them out right now. And the fact that we are afraid of being persecuted we're trying to move forward with mental health, with overall health. It, it, I just don't understand the world that we're living in. Um, my church has been closed. My school has been closed. My job has been uh, quit. I, I'm, I'm on unemployment right now, a place where I never thought I would be. I know that other cities are not enforcing and closing businesses like this, and yet our county is choosing to. I just don't understand where the line is going to be drawn. Um, I don't see how private citizens are going to, oh, I just don't understand how we're gonna allow this. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not being as clear as I wanna be. I'm very upset right now. I support all the other small business owners. I am not a small business owner, I'm a private citizen. But um, the fact that we can allow the hate speech that's going on for those of us that choose to put mental health first and mental health of first responders, nurses, educators first, is insane. Thank you. Peyton, if you could please state your name. Peyton. You're unmuted if you'd like to make a comment. Adam, if you could please state your name. Adam Nanini, resident of Hollister. Um, in this meeting, when the supervisors were discussing this ordinance, it became clear that even amongst yourselves, you don't understand the extent of this ordinance, the enforcement, uh, who it applies to, who it doesn't apply to. So if you, if you can vote in favor of an ordinance that it's clear you don't even understand, then it shows that you're not serious. You're not uh, honestly assessing the situation. You're doing it based on social pressures. So I would encourage you to be honest, and vote no against this order because it's clear you don't understand it. Um, the other thing is that it we've seen just on this call, and I'm sure everyone's seen in their own personal lives, uh, the, the extent that people are going to use this against others. It's clear, we've heard it on this call already. People are gonna use this as a weapon. And like I said, you don't even know who it's gonna be enforced against. Vote no. If you don't, it's irresponsible. Thanks. If you could please state your name. Okay. 
You have been unmuted. If you could please unmute yourself. Rob, if you could please state your name. Hi there, this is Rob Bernoski. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Go ahead, sir. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. He has muted maybe or something. Else. We can hear you, Rob. I, you might have something going on with your computer. Muted or something. Come back to him. If you could please state your name. You have been unmuted. If you could please unmute yourself. <laughs> Maria, if you could please state your name. Hello, this is uh, Maria Lamberson. I am a political scientist and uh, also a resident of San Benito County. Unfortunately, uh, this COVID virus that has um, permeated the United States is not a joke and it is not a flu. I have many friends who are uh, scientists and doctors and uh, it's not going away any, anytime soon. I'm sorry that all these businesses have to suffer I'm sure they'd like to have concerts and sell real estate and um, solve social uh, issues. But unfortunately, at this time, there is some unclarity as far as the governor's um, orders for our public safety. And those need to be um, resolved prior to you voting on whether or not we should uh, close all the businesses I'm not against it, but I'm not for it. And I'm not, uh, I'm not a scientist, but I am a political theorist. So um, with that in mind, and also I'd like to make a reference to uh, Senator McCarthy with, during McCarthyism, when one, when one person pointed out that uh, this is violating constitutional rights. Well, the safety of public health is at stake. So for those people, non-believers who don't want to wear a mask, by all means, don't wear one. You get sick, you get sick. Um, another thing is I don't agree with the finger pointing um, with, I don't believe that we need that police power. I don't need that strong arm there. Um, but I do believe that you have some very big, big uh, choices to make in enforcing this ordinance. And I also would please uh, respect um, your authority and it should be respected by all community members as well. I, I know that this is difficult for you. This is as difficult for all business owners and for all residents of San Benito County. But I urge you to uh, review this ordinance prior to voting, perhaps set it aside and um, uh, maybe make some amendments to it or uh, really uh, that really needs uh, more clarity than what is at stake now. Uh, with this, I, I return the floor to you. Thank you for your time and consideration. And um, Jim uh, Gilio, uh, my best to you and your family. Good luck. Thank you, Thank you for your service. Thank you. If you could please state your name.
You have been unmuted. If you could please unmute yourself. Monica, if you could please state your name. Hello, my name is Monica Cross. I'm a resident of San Bernardino County. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. As a small rural community, we need to think and act logically based on actual data that pertains to our small specific community. On an elementary level, it's vital that we define our terms. <clears throat> what exactly constitutes a health crisis or a state of emergency. In our county, we have experienced zero children dying of COVID, two adults in a six month period. For the sake of scientific evaluation, these numbers do not constitute an emergency. In regard to contact tracing and increased testing, it is very clear that with expanded testing is doing to our small community, it is literally shutting down social interaction which is vital to our health, small business success, increased government control, and completely transforming our education system, placing our most vulnerable and at-risk children at a total disadvantage. In this critical time of social injustices being addressed, this seems to be a glaring opportunity to discriminate against this at-risk population of children. In San Benito County, we have been compliant with masking and social distancing, and still the cases are increasing exponentially. This type of surveillance that you are suggesting is dangerous and unnecessary. It creates a hostile environment. It is incomprehensible that we are transforming and, and completely destroying our local small businesses based on these numbers. If any of this were truly about our health and our safety and saving lives, we would put these millions of dollars toward more effective and necessary local programs. It's absolutely clear that a majority of our board of supervisors hold their power very closely and they're not willing to protect their constituents' constitutional rights. All I hear is each one of you passing the buck to the next person. You are not looking out for the health and safety. We have had two deaths locally. I can't believe that we're succumbing to the hostile civilian surveillance program based on our numbers. It seems that our local government officials are being bought by Governor Newsom to implement these programs locally and do his dirty work in order to receive federal funding. Thank you. Next speaker. If you could please state your name. If you could please unmute yourself. Peyton, if you could please state your name. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Peyton Evans and I'm 14 years old and I came to speak today because I'm upset on how this community is treating small businesses. And my mother, she's the owner of a small business, Kamal Yoga Studio, is being fined for $10,000 for simply wanting people to, to simply provide for me and my family and for the community. People want to come to her class and people love that she's open. People should be able to choose for themselves and what they want to do. We, who are we to judge someone else and assume their situation? Who are we to make someone do something that they don't want to do? This has happened before in society and it hasn't helped at all. We need to be considerate of everyone and we only need to understand that we are all essential. All these small businesses are because they provide for the ones that they love. We don't know the situations and we need to be considerate of that. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you, next speaker. If you could please state your name. If you could please unmute yourself. Thank you. 
Rob, if you could please state your name. Rob Bernoski. Yes, sir. Rob Bernoski. Hey there. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I appreciate your patience with me. So, listen, I'm adamantly opposed uh, to the item uh, as presented. Uh, I'm a big believer in due process, and I believe that due process by the uh, any potential um, uh, person who violates the ordinance is lessened when it is not done through the proper channels of, of uh, law enforcement and um, a courtroom. We are a divided community on uh, this issue, and I think we all need to realize that. And that divisiveness can lead to, um, you know, people over complaining and things like that. And and you know, I believe that a judge is the best person always to uh, to uh, be the litigator of that. Messaging is key in this situation, and. I think it has been somewhat bad, even though um, I've not been in the past couple of meetings. Today's meeting has, has shocked me in a positive way that it just seems like the Board of Supervisors um, is actually more compassionate towards the business people than maybe I picked up on um, before. But overall, it seems like there is an adversarial relationship between um, you know, some of the public and the government i.e. the messaging we get at the national level is it's okay to protest, but it's not okay to go to church. I mean, this bothers me to such an extent that we were at a memorial service recently and there was someone taking pictures um, of us at the church doing it. And I said to my wife, I said, wow, I don't want these pictures posted on Facebook because I'm worried that somebody's going to now attack us for being at a church service. So anyway, I would just, um, ask that the Board of Supervisors not pass this, but really do work on building a relationship with the community of both sides to say, look, we need to combat this thing, but we're not going to come back um, at you uh, with picking and choosing who we're going to um, be able to prosecute um, uh, or not. So again, I, um, I cannot imagine the difficulties that you have with this decision. We have the same thing tonight at a, uh, a board meeting of the Hollis School District on opening or closing schools, so on and so forth. And uh, but I appreciate you listening to us. Next speaker, please. Melissa, if you could please state your name. Melissa, if you could please unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Melissa Gong. I am a resident of San Benito County. I first want to go ahead and say that um, anyone threatening anyone's children or families as a result of not wanting to comply with the mask ordinance, um, while frustrating and infuriating, threatening anyone's family is a non-starter. So that should just not be happening, period. Uh, I also want to say that the mobilization efforts, as is evident by the fact that you've had Courtney Nielsen Evans, Hunter Cuneo, and Vidana Freitas, who represent the Open San Benito County movement, the fact that they've represented their views and screened their views to the Board of Supervisors meeting is wholly ridiculous and unacceptable. We need to recognize that as a county, we are not equipped if we have anybody that becomes severely ill with COVID-19. Our hospital is a small community access hospital, which only has 25 beds. And as we found out through the governor's speaking yesterday at his press conference and the refuting of this by the health department and Hazel Hawkins Hospital, we only have four ICU beds available, of which right now 50% are available. We do not have cardiology, neurology, or nephrology on staff, which are things that happen with patients who have COVID-19. They develop multi-organ system dysfunction. That being said, we're going to have to lifelike those patients out of the county because of the fact that we can't care for them. They're going to go to Monterey County or Bay Area hospitals. Bay Area hospitals and Monterey County are busy with their own patients but we have flown San Benito County open. We went all the way through phase three, though we met none of the gate criteria for us to be open. While having an ordinance that is going to restrict 
gatherings seem severe and intrusive, it's what's necessary. There's been questions about the fact I can't bring my parents groceries. Yes, you can bring your parents groceries. Yes, you can have a small gathering with your children if you want to for dinner. But you don't need to have raging backyard parties with bounce houses, which is what's been going on. We need to stop thinking about the fact that people want to go do farm workouts and yoga and but Diana Freitas is not even closed because she's seen herself an essential business with real estate. People can go do all the things that they want to go do when this is over. But we need to get there and we need to get there together in a unified way. And if we didn't have the anti-mask movement that's led by Open San Benito County and Supervisor Peter Hernandez, we would be in a better position for that to happen. We also need to recognize that San Benito County is a bedroom community. We are not an island unto ourselves. People leave the county to shop and go to work. So we have to look at infection rates from the county surrounding us. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Aaron, if you could please unmute yourself. Hello, you hear me? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is Aaron Livingston, resident of San Benito County. Just a couple of questions that I don't know that you've considered because I certainly haven't heard you discuss it. Um, I believe there are actually many that in your rush to approve this ordinance you haven't considered. So several times during this meeting, I have heard you mention that the largest contributor to our quote, rising cases are home gatherings. So is it your intention with this ordinance to have untrained code enforcement officers knock on the doors of private citizens suspected of having an unauthorized gathering? This would endanger your officer, the public, and law enforcement. It's a recipe for disaster that will likely quickly escalate to a 911 call. The last thing our police department and sheriff's office need during these turbulent times is to respond to a situation that's already gotten out of control when this contact never had to happen in the first place. Additionally, how will you handle citizens with true exemptions as clearly spelled out in the CDPH guidelines? Will you be forcing citizens to disclose private medical conditions in public settings? I urge you to vote no on this glaring overreach that perpetuates the overreach of our governor. It will pit citizens against each other and tear our community apart. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. If you could please state your name. If you could please unmute yourself. If you'd like to make a comment, press star nine or raise your hand. Can we go to the next and come back possibly? We have no more. No more speakers. I'll bring it back to the. Um, sorry, in the uh, in the uh, chamber we have a speaker. Any any other speakers uh, after Miss um, Salinas? Go ahead, uh, Elia. Wow, it's twelve thirty. I didn't realize what time it was. Thank you uh, for letting me speak. So um, just so there's no misunderstanding, the board of supervisors from the very beginning have taken into account what is in the best interest of their constituents and every single person in this county. And they decided a long time ago, very early on, they were one of the first ones to decide to shut down. And they are very pro-business. Every single one of those supervisors, I know them. I know they all have, they all have either, either a business or are working. <laughs> so obviously they're, but they, re, they represent a lot of businesses in this area. So for anyone out there to say that they, they have no interest and that they're now just getting interested in businesses and what's going on with the local businesses, that's not true. From day one, this is what they, when they sit up here, this is exactly what they do. If any fault on the numbers rising is by those who choose not to follow guidelines that can keep you healthy, wear a mask, wash your hands, do your distancing, physical distancing. You don't have to do social. You can do uh, their social distancing. You can still get on the phone. You can do Facebook. You can do 
uh, FaceTime, you can do Zoom. People have Zoom parties all the time. People have Zoom meetings all the time. So it's not like it's an isolation. Um, going out there and just vagrantly disobeying and, and just continuing your business and throwing it into the face of the supervisors with your middle finger and saying, here I am, and how dare you try to come after me because I'm doing, they're not coming after you personally because you are violating. They're coming after you because you choose to not abide by what the rules are. So if you're going to have a gathering of 20 people or 11 people, you're not following the rules. As someone said earlier, you can go take groceries to your parents. You can take groceries to your neighbors. I do this. I do this all the time. I go there. I drop it at the door, knock on the door, or give them a phone call, or I text message. The food is there. It's not like you can't go out and do and continue your life. You just have to be aware that there are rules to be followed. If I'm speeding, the guy next to me can't call 911 and tell CHP I'm speeding. CHP has to see, witness it themselves, that it's an infraction, as, as uh, Supervisor Gilio said. There is... Uh, what Barbara was trying to say earlier is that an administrative hearing, obviously none of you are aware, you're laypersons, but it's either it's heard by a retired judge, a judge pro tem, an, a practicing attorney, so it's someone who knows the law, so it's not someone who's going to make a decision on you that you're not, your, your constitutional rights are being violated. Thank you. Thank you, Elio. We have two more comments. Do we have any, anybody else in the chamber that would like to speak? Mr. Bencord, I think you're the only one left. You sure? All right. Um, go right ahead with the next Zoom comments. Heather, if you could please state your name. If you could please unmute yourself, Heather. If you could please state your name. Hello. Hello, this is Chris Gilmer. Can you Chris, you have a really bad echo. Um, something, maybe a speaker or something on there. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Much better. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm a resident of San Benito County. I was calling to um, address some of the topics that have been mentioned already by uh, several of the callers. Um, with regards to your decision to uh, vote on this matter, uh, one of the things that I'd like to point out is that um, we've already seen that there's uh, lawsuits at the state level for violation of constitutional rights with regards to some of these orders and the decisions that are being made at that level. Um, from a, a law enforcement perspective, uh, obviously the, all of the officers within this county um, have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. Um, that gives them a, a level of discretion, especially with regards to enforcement of uh, misdemeanor crimes and infractions. Um, the question that I would pose is, what is the district attorney's willingness to prosecute these low-level crimes when when we've seen statewide that we're releasing prisoners um, for a myriad of reasons. Um, officers are already utilizing their discretion with regards to low-level offenses, both misdemeanor and infractions on a daily basis. Every traffic violation, every low-level drug offense right now is getting um, officer discretion applied to it because the district attorney simply can't deal with the the overwhelming amount of crime that's happening. So now we're going to add in um, infractions and misdemeanors that are already being reviewed within the courts as to their constitutionality. So I bring this up to, to the board with regards in your decision to pass this law because um, I think it's been stated uh, ad nauseum the 
problems with pitting the citizenry against each other, pitting law enforcement against the citizenry, et cetera, et cetera. But these, this law is already very questionable to begin with um, at the state level and the directive to pass it down to the county level. Uh, I heard one of the members of the board earlier say that we were, we were just doing essentially what the state had told us to. That's completely unacceptable to me. You're talking about local ordinances and following a governor's directive that is extremely questionable at this point. Um, you guys have uh, a decision, you know, when you cast your vote. Um, consider this. Uh, <clears throat> I think I'm, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have any more speakers, sir? <laughs> yes, we do. If you could please state your name. If you could please unmute yourself. Heather, if you could please state your name. Hello, this is Heather Lopez. I'm a San Benito County resident. Can you hear me? Go right ahead. Yes, madam, go ahead. Okay. Um, I vehemently oppose this ordinance. Um, I want to give some advice that I give to my very young children who seem to understand this very well. So I'm hoping that reasonable, accountable civil servants would also hear it, that anything done in haste is never done well. So to quickly pass an ordinance that I do agree with the gentleman that spoke earlier, um, is clearly not completely understood. There's a lot of vague language. Um, is a poor idea and will end up in poor results. Um, on a more uh, stronger note, some of the language used in that and certainly pitting neighbor against neighbor is so not say yes in its language that it terrifies me. It terrifies me. And there will be accountability, maybe not now, during this fear and panic over our health and the health of our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones. But at some point, there will be accountability for every decision this county makes. So I want you to just think really carefully before you go passing this ordinance about what it is you're willing to give up, whether it be your character, your liberties, your votes of the people, think really, really, really hard. Because it's obviously in the end, it's in your hands. Um, I'd like to end by quoting one of my very favorite founding fathers, Ben Franklin, who said, any society that will give up liberty to gain a little security will deserve neither and lose both. We are not a large county. We are not exponentially suffering the effects of COVID. And if you go back and study any kind of plague from the bubonic in the Renaissance to the Spanish flu in the early 20th century, it will continue to spread. There is no way to stop it. The best that we could do at this point until they come up with a vaccine is to slow the spread. And I feel San Bernardino County has done an excellent job of that. They've done an excellent job of that. We are going to see a rise in cases, period. And the only way would be to lock everybody up in their home, close every business, and deny everybody any rights. You can't function a society on that. You have to find a middle ground. And I think San Benito County was doing a pretty good job of it until this ordinance came up and the reclosures came up. Thank you very much. Kevin, Thanks. if you could please state your name. Hi, this is Kevin Barcellos, uh, Lynn Hollister. Um, first of all, I just want to um, express my gratitude to Supervisor Gilio for his service to both the city of Hollister and the county, and um, echo the previous speaker.
speakers who um, said that you're going to be missed. And we hope you and your family um, nothing but the best going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, we have no more comments. No more comments? I think uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Barcelos, did you, did you have a comment as well, or was it just that? I thought he was going to go into a comment. Did we cut him off? That's it? All right. Sorry. Sorry about that. I misunderstood him. I thought he was going to say, he just I wanted to say thank off. you. Yeah. Th thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, bring it back to the board. Okay, hi me. This hey, is Mark Medina. Can I speak? Yes, sir. Okay, let me um, let me start off by saying, I've been back and forth on this issue. I've been uh, I received many, many, many phone calls, starting on Friday when I first posted this, and people started understanding what was uh, happening. You know, I did a lot of research, looking at different counties, different cities and even different states. You know, these type of ordinances aren't Democrat or Republican. You have Oklahoma who has implemented the same type of ordinance. It's Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Um, you know, I looked at our neighboring, our neighbors. Uh, as a matter of fact, Marin in Northern California, they're sitting in session right now talking about the same ordinance we have in front of us. But at this time, there's just too much gray area. There's too many unknowns. There's too many doubts. There's too many things out there that you, we would not be able to correctly enforce. So I'm looking at this right now where I can't pass this today. I need to go back and look at these things, need to get, receive a little bit more information before I can formulate any type of uh, decision. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you for everyone that spoke. Please understand that when we come to the dais, we don't come with the answers always. We listen to everyone out there and to all the people that called me over the weekend. I, I do listen and I think everybody on this board has that same idea. We don't come to meetings already with our minds already made up. We make them up here. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Medina. Supervisor Patel. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I too want to thank everybody who took time to uh, uh, Testify, it's valuable. Um, and but you got to keep in mind, we're not looking to close down businesses. We're not looking to kind of be punitive and, and put in be stringent enforcement and collect money for people and put a hardship on them. Uh, we're, we're, we live here, we have family and friends, and, um, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, every rule, every ordinance has to have a little bit of enforcement uh, capability. And I, I think there could be some work done with this. Uh, Supervisor Medina pointed out. Um, but we have to have something in place. And it's not anti business. It, and uh, we are part of the state of California. And, you know, we, we have to follow. The, the rules and the laws that are passed down to to the counties. You know, one of the things um, that uh, I'm going to say, I, 50 years uh, from now, 60, um, people are looking back at this time, and they're not going to mistake us for the greatest generation. You know, I, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, selfishness. Uh, in disregard in, in the name of so-called personal rights. There's a lack of real caring for our fellow citizens. Uh, and it really begins at the national level. I've been really disappointed with the messaging coming from the federal level. And then it comes back down to the state levels that there's a, a huge contradiction. And, you know, it, 
I agree with some of the speakers. So, you know, how, how is uh, closing down the churches and indoor dining, but you allow protesting, um, and you can't get together with your family in, in the backyard. The, there's a lot of contradictions, and um, we're just trying to sort through it and work our way as best we can. I'm worried that if we don't have some type of enforcement for those really bad actors, um, we're, we're jeopardizing our Care, uh, CARES Act money. And like it or not, the state has control of that. And we desperately need those funds here locally. And, um, you know, that's, that's just how it works. So I, I think we need to, I guess this was a four-fifths vote. I, I don't expect it to pass. Uh, especially without Supervisor Medina's support. But we have to um, come back with something that will. And and we have to have leadership uh, locally that people and businesses are expected to follow the guidances to keep public health um, as a priority. We have to care for each other. And, uh, and those that are you know having a hard time doing that but uh, they should be uh held accountable and that's where i'm at with it thank you thank you supervisor i uh, know sir I've, I've uh said said what i did before thank you thank you supervisor hernandez thanks mr chair um so i although i appreciate the sentiment of supervisor tell I strongly disagree with him um, there's that a lot of things are very questionable the way this rollout has happened I think the public isn't um, it, they're not out of touch with with trying to really connect the reality of, of the this COVID the impacts not just on health but ultimately on what it means to uh, to do business to you know or, or the individuals that are trying to live their lives um, I come under the assumption to a certain extent under the experience that most folks want to do the right thing. So uh, I always said from the beginning, we should make partners with our community and with our businesses. Uh, if you think about it, they really are, the business community are very policy driven. It's within the context of their DNA to manage their lives, their business in a way that's structured, that's, that's safe, that, uh, that ultimately mitigates any risks you know, they, they do their due diligence for a reason. So, uh, you know, and, and I know for me, to, for what it means to, to try to be successful in business doesn't live under assumptions. Um, there's risks in starting business, but nonetheless, you're diligent in doing your homework and mitigating those risks and planning for those risks. And that's the consistency that I heard from the public. So, uh, when it comes down to the inconsistencies of, of this governor and the way that he's rolled this out, to a certain extent, it's questionable how much, whether it's intentional or not, his rules are actually doing more damage than good. And I think that's what I'm hearing personally from the public. So, uh, and I'd, I'd just like to leave Supervisor Botelli with this. Supervisor Botella with this is a, I can't remember exactly which founder said it, but, um, but he said the constitution was made to protect us against people with good intentions. We can't make decisions off of just good intentions. That's not good enough. We have to make decisions based off of what's actually practical, applicable, and ultimately expects, demands good outcomes. Those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my comments are very simple, and that is that the state of California is no friend of San Diego County. And you guys have heard me say that many, many, many times over. However, in this one case, we're handicapped. If we don't have any type of enforcement in place, the CARE Act money has a great, great potential of being diverted back to the state of the federal government. And sooner or later, the state of California is going to come on us and, and, and enforce some type of role, uh, ordinance. So we either work together to develop an enforcement 
that all five of us can work with, or we're gonna let, or the state of California is gonna dictate to us how we do it. And I prefer local control. And and if he holds us, if we if we don't approve anything, because there are members of the community thinking that we're taking away their constitutional right, I, I, as some other members of the public said, this is a health issue, not a Republican or a Democrat, because we all support businesses. Supervisor Patel, Supervisor Hernandez, Medina, Jim Gilio. Oh, we, we, in some way or another, are either controllers, fault management, or business owners. We understand what this thing is doing to us. We, we get it. We understand. Unfortunately, as elected officials, we have, we're the bearers of bad news. And this is bad news. And we have to do something. To do nothing is not an acceptable option. We have to do something. And Supervisor Patel mentioned that uh, without Supervisor Medina's support, we can't get anything. So. I, I challenge Supervisor Medina to to come up with some modification so we can work and do something. But it has to be done. Okay, what's the pleasure of the board? No. No. Well, if I understand, Mr. Chairman, um, if we're not going to get four fifths vote, uh, we read the title of the ordinance, waive further reading and accept the introduction and continue it to the four, uh, to uh, the next meeting, August 4th uh, for adoption. Right, what you need to do is read number two and then depending on the votes, if it's four fifths, it gets enacted today. If it doesn't get four fifths, then it goes to the August 4th meeting. Okay. I think the issue is you're not capturing any of the changes that um, were brought up with, um, you know, the, the, the concerns that were brought up by our, our legal counsel, just to keep that in, in mind. You may want to bring back a clean copy for, for then, just a suggestion. Um, thank you. Another motion, if we didn't think that there was going to be three-fifths vote today, is to direct it to be placed on the next agenda with uh, Supervisor Medina working with staff to to uh, come up with a, a, a version that would be placed on the next agenda, if if the board would like. Supervisor Patel. Is that a motion? That was Barbara. Um, Pardon? Just if uh, if the board also did not, it, if the board wanted to, it could also direct it be placed on the next agenda as well. Yeah, the board has a, that ability to do that, the way it's written on the agenda. Okay, what's the pleasure of the board again? Okay, so um, I, I was just trying to get back to what Supervisor Gilio was uh, referring to. Um, do we still need to uh, try to do, uh, adopt the urgency ordinance to get to the um, to be heard on 8-4? Eight, eight, or are we just going to send it back and continue the item and see if uh, Supervisor Medina could kind of clear up some of the gray areas uh, that he's concerned about with uh, County Council? Um. I know that perhaps he would like to make some more changes regarding um, enforcement on non-commercial just being related to face um, facial coverings. So since we don't have that language in the ordinance, um, perhaps it should, should be brought back at the next meeting. Um, because once you introduce an ordinance, then you can't make any substantive changes um, between that meeting and the next meeting when it's adopted. So if there's going to be, if we're not, if we don't have the final, final language right now, then we should bring it back at the next meeting. Okay. Um, with that said, then I'll uh, make a motion, Mr. Chairman, to uh, continue the item to the next meeting. Okay. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 No. Again, motion. Okay, we will now go to question. Four one. If we could note for the record, four one. Who was the one? No. 
Was it Supervisor, Supervisor Hernandez? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Okay. Um, okay, now we will go to question. Barbara? Okay. Uh, closed session, Conference Legal Council. Conference Legal Council regarding anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation pursuant to subdiv subdivision D4 of Government Code Section 54956.9, number of cases 2. Closed session, significant exposure to litigation uh, pursuant to 54956.9 D2, D2 and E1 and E2. Closed session, conference with legal counsel, co closed session pursuant regarding pending litigation, government code section 54956.9 A, preserve our rural communities versus County San Benito at Al Can San Benito County Superior Court, case number CU-20-0053. Thirty-eight closed session conference with legal counsel number of cases one subdivision A and D one of five four nine five six point nine name of cases Rose at Al versus County of San Benito Superior Court of California County of San Benito case number CU seventeen dash zero zero one five one and forty our last one is closed session conference with labor negotiators agency designated representatives Michael McDougal Ray Espinoza Edgar Nolasco Stuart Patry. Elvia Barocio and Barbara Thompson, employee organizations and institutions, <laughs> association, law enforcement, management, management, employees group, SEIU Local 521, uh, deputy sheriffs, confidential employees, confidential management, appointed department heads and unrepresented employees, pursuant to 54957.6. Is there anyone from the public?
Oh, no reportable action. Okay, nothing, nothing to report? No. Okay, let's go back to the regular agenda number 30, 30, 34. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Receive information. Thank you. So, um, as your board is aware, um, we've um, been working diligently with the CARES Act and some programming um, for our community, as well as addressing our needs um, because of the COVID. Um, I wanted to share a couple things with the board. Um, with that, we're receiving approximately 3.4 mil, uh, 6.4 million, a little bit less than that actually is the, is the actual number. And we'll be receiving a first allotment um, in July um, the end of July, about one sixth of, of the funding, as well as in August, another one sixth million, and then a report that we'll have to provide to the state um, uh, by September 1st uh, for releasing uh, additional funds. So I wanted to make sure that the board was aware of that and, um, and also, too, just aware of all the work that uh, Supervisor Anthony Battelle and Supervisor Peter Hernandez and staff have been working on. Really appreciate all the work um, that's gone into development planning, as well as Supervisor Jaime de la Cruz as well, um, on developing programming and um, addressing, um, you know, our, our the issues that are occurring within our community, in particular nonprofits and businesses being impacted by COVID. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and invite up um, Enrique. He's the Deputy Director, Enrique Arriola. He's a Deputy Director in Health and Human Services, and he's been assisting us taking the lead with um, the business programming. So, Enrique. Uh, thank you very much, members of the board and members of the public. I do want to thank the board and also administration for uh, dedicating these uh, funds for assisting our COVID-impacted uh, small businesses. Um, just a quick um, statistics that I think are important. Um, so in the United States, there's approximately 30 million small businesses, and 98% of those have fewer than 100 employees. And what's surprising to me also, 89% uh, of those have fewer than 25 employees, and these are the type of small businesses that we are targeting here for this grant program. And that's no surprise that really it constitutes the majority of the workforce in our county and also in the United States. And most of these uh, small businesses continue to be impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, to, to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on San Benito County businesses and their employees, the county has committed one and a half million dollars for this program. The objective of this program is to offer immediate financial assistance to small businesses located in San Benito County and to aid in maintaining their business and workforce. I do want to make it a point that the deadline was extended an additional week. A notice has gone out and now the deadline to submit the application is on July 27th, which is this Monday at 5 p.m. Uh, applications will be reviewed uh, up until August the 10th. Initially, the applications that are being submitted are being filtered by Workforce Development Board. Uh, staff is reviewing and ensuring that all information is, is attached with the application and also working with the businesses to ensure that everything is, is being submitted. Uh, notifications will go out August 11th through the 17th and funding no later than September 4th. That is our goal. 
So San Bernardino County will provide uh, grants of up to $15,000 million, uh, 15, relief grants to businesses that have been impacted on a first come, first serve basis. So those that are being submitted first are those that are being um, prioritized. So uh, as far as priority, there are three different tiers that have been identified. So tier one under the governor's order of reopening stages three and four for non-essential businesses. Tier two under the governor's order of reopening stages one and two non-essential businesses and tier three, these are the essential businesses. And just to summarize the use of funds, um, uh, expenditures must occur between March the 1st, 2020 and December 30th, 2020 and fall under one or more of the following categories, uh, payroll, business lease rent, business telework equipment costs, inventory acquisition. So this includes inventory needed to reopen or maintain open status, personal protective equipment, PPE, uh, facility readiness, uh, social distancing, preparedness, business modifications, etc. And also for those that, that want reimbursement or lost revenue due to business interruption, if they plan to apply for this, must include the Schedule C. That is one of the requirements. So up to today, I wanted to just uh, mention, actually this is as of yesterday, we've had 106 applications that have been submitted through the uh, portal. And uh, today, this morning, early this morning, we had six additional applications. So I uh, anticipate additional applications being submitted up until the date of uh, deadline. Uh, there were two that were not eligible because of their nonprofit status. So they were referred back to the Community Foundation for their COVID impacted uh, funds to nonprofit organizations. So I think this is uh, really good. Staff is really engaged with the businesses. And I, again, like I said, we're gonna increase this. Uh, I, I anticipate that. So I do wanna make some reminders because uh, as applications are submitted, staff is reviewing to see if all the information requested is being submitted. And we're finding that not all the information is being submitted and, and staff is working with businesses. So remember to complete and sign the small business grant application. So if you submit the application, make sure it's signed. A copy of valid and active business license. Uh, in some cases, it's forgotten, so make sure that it's submitted. A completed estimated disaster economic injury worksheet. A current copy of W-9, and also make sure that it's signed and dated. There's some that have been submitted without that, so make sure that it's signed and dated. Electronic payment information form. It's also important to attach a voided business check. In some cases, that has not been submitted. Uh, landlord and lease detail form, and that's if requesting assistance for lease payment. Uh, last and current fiscal year financial statement, profit and loss statement, and balance sheet, or Schedule C of your tax return, and that's if businesses are seeking reimbursement for lost revenue of business interruption that required closure. So I just wanted to really point that out to make sure that all applications are submitted in, in, in whole with all required information. So the applications are to be submitted at the small business at cosb.us. Again, uh, the extended late deadline is July 27th, uh, 2020 by 5 p.m. So it's, it's, it's really important to make sure to submit them by 5 p.m. Uh, also to point out, there's a Spanish application that is also available. It's been circulated on social media and different venues and also at the county's website. It's also noted there. Uh, we've also been asked the question, well, is this a loan? So even though the application says a grant, um, just to clarify, uh, it, it is a grant. It is not a loan and for the eligible uses that are highlighted there in the guidelines. Um, I also wanted to point out that just today we went ahead and are planning two, two overviews of, of the application process, one in English and one in Spanish. So that's going to take place this Thursday at 2.30 p.m. via Zoom. So notices will come out this evening, this afternoon. Staff is working on this right now. 
The English one will be uh, moderated by uh, Michelle with the Chamber of Commerce, and that's going to be this Thursday, 2.30, 3.30, and then the Spanish one will be right following 3.30 to 4.30, and I'll be helping moderate that one as well. So if there's any questions, questions could be directed to the small business at cusb.us. Staff will respond and also the option to call 831-637-5627. So I wanted to point that out so those businesses that are interested in, in participating and listening in and asking questions that you may have, feel free to, to log in and information will be sent out by all venues uh, starting tonight and tomorrow and Thursday. So I wanted to point that out. So that concludes my brief presentation on the uh, business uh, grant program. Are there any questions? I just want to say thank you, Enrique. You've done a lot of homework on this, and we've worked really well with uh, the supervisors and planning, and 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 just you know. And I appreciate the extension. I know that that was uh, with with changes and stuff. You guys had to adapt, and 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 I appreciate that you called me and you you tried to inform me about it. And uh, ultimately, this has been such a, I mean, to a certain extent, it's it's been a. I've been really grateful to be a part of something that seems to be more focused mm -hmm. on solutions. So thank you for your time. And just really Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I want to thank Enrique as well and do say uh, Alfonso uh, for their hard work. If without uh, our staff uh, putting in so many hours, uh, it, it's hard to get to this point. And and we're gonna help a lot of businesses. I want to thank uh, also Supervisor Hernandez for uh, his his work on this. We've been working a bit of uh, hours with our staff and uh, he's a head up at the uh, committee uh, for the applications uh, and uh, I really appreciate everything he's doing. Thank you, Anthony. And just really quick, I wanted to thank the staff. The staff is doing a lot of the day-to-day -day work in reviewing and completing the summary sheet for every application being submitted and interacting with the businesses. So thank you, uh, Sylvia, Ruby, and all the staff that's working on this program. Supervisor Martina? Nothing, sir. Thank you. Supervisor Jim Thank you. I, I just wanted to echo the same um, sentiments. Thank you guys all for your hard work. Enrique, the team, Dulce, uh, and especially uh, um, everybody that had uh, effort, uh, efforts in this because I got to tell you, this is a huge deal, and um, I, I don't know any other county, regardless of uh, size in our area, that's, that's dedicated this um, uh, percentage and amount of funds. And thank you, uh, Supervisor Patello and Supervisor Hernandez for taking the extraordinary amount of time that it takes to administer this. And I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you Rick, for you and, you and the staff and Dulce and everyone else. Uh, on that note, I'm gonna open up to the public. Uh, do you have any speaker cards? If you wish to make a comment, press star nine or raise your hand. We do not have any comments at this time. Oh, yes, we do. You no comments from the public? Could you please state your name? Hello? Yeah, we also have one inside our chambers. Oh, we have one. Go Yes, madam. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. I have a couple of uh, questions, and I'd like to actually start off with thanking um, Supervisor 
uh, Peter Hernandez and um, Anthony Batello, first they've from the very get-go, they've been communicating uh, with all the businesses, and they've had several seminars or forums with different businesses trying to find out what they were doing, what they were lacking. And I know Peter's been working super hard with trying to find out and getting information on how uh, these businesses can get some funds. And so I know that uh, he's been working tirelessly with this. And with that being said, um, my only concern is with this funds is I'm hoping um, you all are aware, you have access to the um, Small Business Administration's uh, link to where all the lists are for the PPP money, the payroll protection program money. Anyway, um, my concern is that I want to make sure that the businesses, those 106 so far, 112 that have applied, are not businesses that already received PPP money. If for whatever reason, if these, these should have priority if they did not receive the money. I don't want them double dipping. I, there are, I know uh, uh, one company or one business and her uh, dress shop burned down on San Benito Street. For whatever reason, she didn't qualify. She didn't have enough information to get PPP money. And I encouraged her to apply for the care money. And I would like those type of businesses to get in front of the line. So. I'm hoping that as you're getting these applications, you're looking up the names um, that they have not already received money. We had almost no more than $36 million come into San Benito County with PPP money. If you've looked at the list, there's names on there that should not have gotten it, but they obviously they applied and for whatever reason they qualified. But I would hate for small businesses like this hairdress salon to not be able to have access to the money when someone else has already gotten access to the money via the federal government and their application system and they're out of business. And also one of the other things that I think it was early on that I would think it was um, Supervisor Dela Cruz that mentioned if, or maybe Patello, if the business was already not doing well and really literally was not affected because of COVID, but it was the final coffin, do they really qualify for these monies if they were, it was already a loss of business? So I would use, for instance, we didn't go into the emergency until the middle of March. So if this companies did not make their rent payment on March 1st, there was already an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speaker cards? We do not have any more comments. No more comments, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. We'll bring it back to the board. Um, according to Chris Middle, it's just how it is, just number one, which we already received the report, and then number two, which delegate authority to the sale to allocate the CARES Act funding. Um, is there a motion on the table for that one? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, before we make the motion, uh, uh, I want to answer the uh, public speaker's uh, concerns. Yes. And, and yes, uh, and that we ask uh, specific questions in the application process if you've received any other um, help. And uh, of course, we're prioritized, you know, we want to prioritize the, the smaller businesses, uh, the ones that didn't qualify, because there's a number of them. And, and the dress shop is an example. My, the poor lady that cuts my hair. Uh, her place burnt down uh, last uh, Sunday as well, and uh, she didn't. Uh, she's supposed to apply for this, as, and so we really want to help those type of people. Thank you. I could elaborate to a little bit, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the questions. I think they're valid ones. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the PPP, it requires that you stay open because it's you know the, the main intention is uh the original formula required that you use i think it was 80 percent for payroll purposes in order for it to be forgivable otherwise it flips and it basically changes into a loan and then it uh under the new cares act funding it it morphed into a 60 percent requirement and tried to be a little bit more lenient it extended the deadline so so businesses had time to still apply so long and short right now i think it's coming up on the actual forgiveness element to be able to apply for it but nonetheless, yeah, the questions are valid because we want to make sure that funding, and I know that was what we talked about, and that's what Enrique dug through really deep uh, and, and staff, 
that uh, the, the ones that would rise to the top would be those businesses that were the hardest hit. And that's why even some of the expectations was as a uh, uh, phase three and four folks to get priority as an example. And so there's, there's a filtering process, but it's definitely focused on those that, that re didn't receive any benefit or completely shut down. Uh, whereas, yeah, if you, if you have PPP, you technically stayed open. So there's a, there's a filtering process focusing on that. That's Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm prepared to make a motion. Yes. And Mr. Chair, if I may real quick, just for clarity purposes. So the board already did allocate the funding amounts in the different pots of money. This is just a form formalization of actually authorizing this amount, the, the monies to move forward. So that, that's all this uh, recommendation is for. Mr. Chair, Gilio moves delegate authority to CAO to allocate the CARES Act funding with the approval of the ad hoc in the Roadmap to Recovery Advisory for COVID-19. I second Medina. Thank you. Motion by Gilio, second by Martina. All those in favor say aye. 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 Again, motion carries. Thank you. Now we will go to item number 35, right? I'm going to present that one. So on the consent today, the clerk recorder uh, register of vote. Ver voters certified that there were significant signatures that were received on the Strata Verde initiative. The board can adopt the initiative measure at this time or submit it uh, to the voters at the November 2020 election. The board previously requested then a, a report pursuant to elections code 9111, which is relevant to the board's decision about whether or not to adopt the initiative, um, be prepared and that's scheduled to be received before the 8-4 uh, agenda. Um, so if the board has a, a desire to um, adopt the initiative directly, then the board could continue this matter to the next meeting. But as the applicant will speak today, I believe that even if the applicant uh, it does not uh, expect the Board of Supervisors to adopt this initiative at today's meeting, but rather it is their request and they expect the board uh, to call for the election. In that matter, it's a ministerial task um, it's discretionary as to whether or not to call to adopt the measure at this time, but it's ministerial in the fact that since the initiative had sufficient signatures, placing it on the ballot measure, um, placing it on the ballots, um, a step that the board would have to do if it did not adopt it directly. A resolution has been prepared with the ballot measure language and all the details necessary to call for the um, election. <coughs> um, I will note that ballot arguments will not be agendized at a future board meeting since this is not a county measure. The previous measures that the board has adopted, such as the TOT or the um, vehicle abatement um, measure, we ag uh, had agendized ballot um, arguments because that was a county, proponent, county measure that was propounded by the county. As far as the ballot measure that is on page 879, which is the question that would be submitted to the voters, um, it has to be 75 words or less, and it is. The only change, which is a minor technical change, is that the words, the fourth and fifth words of that question, which um, is the words be adopted, be moved to the end of that sentence. So that it would be shall an initiative and enacting, and then the rest of that sentence. And uh, it would the conclusion of that would be exclusively for agricultural be adopted. And that is a technical change um, set forth in the elections code which um, suggests the words be adopted be at the end of the question, although nobody's ever raised it uh, that I'm aware of has raised a technical uh, challenge to the words being adopted being at the beginning of that question. We've moved it to the end just to be absolutely precise um, to follow that elections code about how the ballot measure should be stated. Um, and I will submit it for any questions that the board may have. Chair, just to be clear, um, Barbara, we have two options. One is to approve this outright. The second one is to let it go to the voters. Yes. Those are the only two options. Um, the, the, in the, in, yes, those are the basic two options. Um, there's uh, kind of a, uh, in the, when it's stated in the code, it talks about calling for a 911 report which the board has already done, but that's 
kind of assumed in the option about adopting it. So I'm combining those for clarity's purposes into two. You have two options. Okay. That's, I mean, we can't say no, we don't want it to go no. to the voters. That's what no. I'm after. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Patel. Nothing. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez. He voted already. He's yeah. been voting already. Voter initiative. Yes, the voter initiative. Okay, Supervisor Gibson. Yeah, um, I, I have no no comments. I'm ready to uh, vote to send it to the ballot. Okay, uh, hold your thoughts on that because we need to hear from the public first. Uh, Supervisor Patel, nothing. Uh, nothing. I'm ready for the public comment. Thank you. All right, let's open up to the public comment. Speaker cards. Victoria Montoya. Victoria Montoya of District 5. Um, I, I just want to understand. I know I wasn't involved with something, a project that was happened years ago, and I went to Arizona and I noticed the area they want they had over there what and they were trying over here it didn't work now this new thing i need to understand for the future generation not for myself is that when you have the developers the voters the non-voters and the landowner who's going to benefit from the new project i'm not a developer i'm not you know i'm just a registered voter but i'm concerned with the traffic and that bridge that comes across from Gilroy to Hollister. It needs some repairing, and I'm not a traveler every day. I don't care, but I care that if you're gonna develop something over there, you better have a very good vision for the future, because Botello said it. We are the generation that are going to be remembered for the future 50, 60 years from now. So Hollister is a beautiful county. I'm, I've always said I like the city more, but, I want somebody to, to make a vision that will help the county all around. The environment, this is the best county when it comes to the green and beautiful rural country, I mean county. So if you guys are gonna put it to the voters, I hope you guys word it correctly because they, the ones that already put it the initiative, they already spent money on getting the people to s register for it. And if it goes through, I am not in favor of developing an area that will have more traffic. And if it brings jobs, I want them here inside the county, not on the outside where the money goes to other counties, including the one on one on one. So that's my opinion. And I do hope to understand when it comes on the ballot, especially some people that don't vote. Thank you, ma'am, for waiting so long to give us your comments. We really appreciate that. And maybe we can have our staff hook up, um, provide her with some information. That'd be great. Yeah, can we get your contact info? I already have oh, okay, thank you. I'm always willing to volunteer Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. It was a long wait. Walk thank you. Safe. Yeah. Actually, actually, she still has a minute to go. Uh, she, okay. was, she was done. <laughs> he said thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Next speaker card. Thank you, guys. David, if you could please state your name. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is David Lazarus. I live outside the county, but I'm here as an attorney from the Nielsen Merksmer Law Firm, which represents the San Benito County proponents of the Strata Verde In Innovation Park Voter Initiative, as well as the campaign in favor of the measure. First, we would like the record to reflect that the initiative's proponents and sponsors are not asking the board to adopt the SVIP voter initiative as law in lieu of an election. Although that is technically permitted under state law, it has always been our intent for this measure to go before the voters in November. We therefore respectfully request that the board simply place the measure on the November ballot. We also respectfully request that this action, which is purely ministerial in nature, be taken today as recommended in the staff report. With the November election quickly approaching, including certain deadlines in early and mid-August related to the publication of ballot materials, acting today to place the measure on the ballot will provide certainty and give the county and everyone else interested in this measure more time to adequately prepare those materials. Second, 
we would like to address certain misinformation being circulated about the alleged lack of CEQA review for the proposed SVIP project. This misinformation is deceptive and it is wrong as a matter of law. It is indeed the case that the placement of a voter initiative on the ballot is not subject to CEQA, but the project itself will be subject to CEQA because the ballot measure is just the initial step. It is the visioning process to be determined by the voters. CEQA compliance, however, will need to occur during the subsequent public planning process, just like any other project that has zoning in place but still needs various discretionary approvals from the county and other agencies to proceed. In short, there needs to be CEQA compliance in order for the project, which will be in the hands of the county and this board after the election to go forward. This is why the SVIP voter initiative itself expressly recognizes in multiple places that CEQA is required. It is in the findings and purpose section right up front at paragraph 12 and in multiple places in the specific plan, including section 1.5 and section 5.4.1, which reads, consistent with state law, future discretionary actions required for development within the specific plan area are subject to, the, to environmental review in compliance with CEQA. The specific plan anticipates the discretionary actions required for the specific plan will include conditions of approval or other measures intended to avoid or substantially lessen environmental impacts of the development anticipated by the specific plan as required by CEQA. Project applicants shall comply with any such legal requirements. In other words, if the CEQA process later identifies Bad internet. What happened? Did, they, did he go out? He ran out of time. Was up. Time was up, sir. He was. He was the representative. My understanding, correct? Yes. Oh, he's not a public comment. Okay. Gotcha. No. Back yeah, he was the representative. I will allow an extra time as the representative, one representative for the project. If he wants to come back on board, he, I will allow him. But. Uh, other than that, let's go to the next speaker card. And when he comes up, we'll allow two more minutes. He's back on. Okay. Um, members of the members of the board, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we can. Okay. Thank you for granting me a, a few more seconds. I was just about to wrap up. I apologize for going long. I just wanted to say, to conclude, to note that the county council's impartial title and summary for the initiative confirms what I was saying about CEQA to be true by providing that the county must still conduct CEQA review for future discretionary development entitlement approvals within the SVIP SP area. In sum, there may be plenty of things voters can debate about the SVIP voter initiative, but the fact that there will indeed be CEQA compliance on this project before it can go forward is not one of them. Thank you very much for your time and consideration and for granting me this additional time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker card. Bob, if you could please state your name. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Tiffany. In addition to being a longtime resident, I'm also the president of the Sammy County Business Council. I, as well as countless other business people in our community, am fully supportive of the Strata Verde Initiative and strongly urge you to put it on the November ballot as intended by the signees and the project proponents. It's fair to say that we've never seen a project that will potentially make such a positive impact as the Strada Verde commercial development. And the timing could not be better, giving us an opportunity to jumpstart the recovery from the pandemic's devastating impact on our economy. To begin with, the project will bring a huge influx of jobs to our county, starting with 14,000 on-site construction workers, and then ultimately, over 4,000 on-site permanent jobs once it's fully built out. It will also bring in a projected $12 million per year in tax revenue to the county, $6 million per year in taxes for local school districts, and a one-time fee of $18 million for required road work. Furthermore, with its tie to cutting-edge autonomous and electric vehicle technology, it will connect us to Silicon Valley and its dynamic economy in a way that no other business here has previously done. 
It will be a high profile development in the greater Bay Area that has the potential to attract additional high tech commercial and industrial companies to our community. And unlike pre previous proposals for this site, the project includes absolutely no residential development and the primary access will be off of Highway 101, not 25. Certainly a project of this size does need to be closely scrutinized by our citizens, planners, and elected officials before it is fully approved. But that's exactly what will happen here. The developers are putting them on the ballot prior to it coming before you and county staff. And as specified in the language of the initiative, as just stated, the project will still go through all the normal CEQA and environmental impact requirements that any project is required to follow. Bottom line, this project will truly be a godsend to our community, something that any other county or city would love to have. It's frankly hard to imagine why there would be anyone against it. Those who can be for a high-tech commercial development, which will be transformative to our community in terms of jobs and revenue, are in favor of virtually nothing. These naysayers want to see absolutely no growth, including job growth, no commercial development of any kind anywhere in our community, and they will say and do anything to win. If they are successful, they will destroy any chance we will have to recover from the pandemic-induced recession. Thankfully, I look forward to the Strata Verde initiative being on the ballot, giving all of our citizens the opportunity to support this outstanding project. And as a quick aside, let me just permit to say, i just like to say publicly, Thank you, sir. how sorry I am to see Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Next speaker card. Colin, if you could please state your name. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, this is Colin Kosmicki. Um, so we certainly need more jobs in the county, but we have to weigh the pros and cons on such a monumental proposal. I've made my views clear about Strata Verde and an, an array of alarming red flags with this initiative, such as concerns over an exemption to conduct a full environmental review on the rezoning and specific plan, this being yet another major commercial component near Highway 101 on the heels of Measure K's defeat, potentially inflated job creation numbers that don't come with any real backing, the lack of a real commitment from the developer to fund adequate road improvements on 25, and major concerns about traffic impacts on 25 and 101, while the developer somehow claims that Highway 25 will not be impacted significantly. That in itself is telling about the credibility of this proposal. Additionally, I'm very concerned about a much speculated county commissioned environmental report prepared earlier this month that is believed to conclude Strata Verde, Verde is potentially too close to the Tricale plant off Highway 25 due to the potential for chemical disasters. I strongly urge the county to release this report immediately to the wider public and agendize a discussion item specifically on it. That said, the most important factor to consider today on such a big proposal is that there hasn't been nearly enough community dialogue on the topic of, of Strata Verde. The board can either approve the project outright or send it to the voters. And I strongly urge you to do the right thing and send this to the ballot so the community can have a real debate about the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, card. Valerie, if you could please state your name. Right there, unmuted. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yes, this is Valerie Eglin with Reach San Benito Parks Foundation. Um, before COVID, parks were a statistical advantage for mental and physical health in the community. Now it is an imperative to provide public open space, paths, and trails for our population. Um, Reach San Benito Parks Foundation commends the Strata Verde project for its proposed trail and paths dedication along the Pajaro River and its floodplain. We do hope that you place this initiative on the November ballot so that the people can see the broad, wide sweeping uh, advantages we can have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bella. Next, pick a card. If you could please state your name. If you could please unmute yourself. Can you please state your name?
Hello. Yes, yeah, sir. Hi, it's this stuff. Uh, this stuff. Uh, it's uh, accurate that this doesn't happen. Sir, we have a hard time listening to you. Can you um, uh, hang up and then call back? Uh, it's inaccurate. Uh, okay, go ahead. Hello? Yes. Uh, it's inaccurate to say that uh, CEQA uh, has not been um, circumvented in uh, rezoning from agricultural to, uh, in this initiative, to uh, commercial. And uh, that's the first step that's been uh, circumvented by uh, this initiative process. Uh, I'd like to propose that uh, because this was done in an emergency time during the coronavirus, that uh, all of the um, initiatives and referenda that were submitted all be submitted to the voters simultaneously. And uh, uh, that would give a chance to, uh, because uh, the um, uh, pork preserve our royal communities suspended uh, signature gathering because of the virus and uh, because that, uh, of the new numbers that were uh, submitted a few weeks ago uh, that uh, the two initiatives and the referendum for uh, preserve our royal communities be submitted also for the voters uh, uh, and be put to the voters Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, next speaker, pardon. Mary, if you could please state your name. Hi, this is Mary Shaw Coron from Aroma, San Benito County. Um, I want to urge the supervisors not to approve the initiative themselves, but to put it on the November ballot, November ballot so that voters have a chance to vote on it. In that respect, I agree with David Lazarus, the attorney for Strada Verde, but I did want to say that I disagree with him about the fact that, um, that the CEQA is not being bypassed. I think it is at the highest level. He talked about the fact that there will be CEQA review, EIR, and that sort of thing for discretionary developments. That's called piecemealing. What's happening here is almost 3,000 acres is being rezoned from farmlands to um, farmlands and, and rural lands to an industrial and commercial zone. That is a big step, and there is a reason that our general plan currently has these lands as um, agricultural and rural. For example, as a previous speaker has, has mentioned, there is, um, besides the fact that we, have, we need a valuable farmland for production of food, there's also a pesticides um, facility called TriCal there. And our understanding is that it could be, it needs a buffer zone. It's actually been discussed in previous meetings. I believe I was reading a Benito Link article that both Mark Medina, Supervisor Medina, and Supervisor Jaime Dela Cruz have talked about a buffer zone around, um, around TriCal to protect uh, the public in case of leakage from the fumigant that they manufacture there. And so zoning is necessary, you know, that it should be agricultural. We don't want to place a lot of people, whether it's industrial or commercial there. So that is something that, you know, may not be reviewed at the discretionary development level once you rezone. So the rezoning is a huge step and it really does require a uh, CEQA review. The other thing I want to say is I am not against jobs. I think that I totally support industrial commercial buildings around Hollister. There's already a lot of land near the airport already zoned for industrial parks. I think it should be placed there. That would be a more appropriate place for jobs and it would reduce the traffic on Highway 25 and 101. I do believe even though right now they don't 
they say they won't have much impact on Highway 25, they will. And I think that once you allow this rezoning, it will expand. And there could be residential development. That's exactly what was proposed in 2005, the El Rancho San Benito proposal, if you recall, was a new community. And I think that is actually the intention of this developer. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Next speaker card. Maria, if you could please state your name. If you could please unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, sorry about that. This is Maria Lamberson once again. Thank you for uh, the time and thank you. I would uh, also uh, agree with uh, Mary, Colin and uh, David as to put this measure to the voters in November. There's a lot of um, a lot of issues that need to be addressed here. And I know that everyone is, is chiming in on CEQA and that is one of them. But another one too is the uh, protection of the land surrounding uh, the area where this manufacturer wants to put um, his uh, industrial. And so since they're going to be electrical vehicles, they're going to require a lot of cooling. If you remember uh, Fukushima plant, um, and what it did to the Pacific uh, Ocean, you may want to uh, go ahead and, and uh, refer back to that so that you could see for yourself what a plant like this would uh, do to a county as small as this with agricultural land. And the land surrounding it should be protected and it should go into uh, environmental protection. I believe there's 20,000 acres that have been trying to, um, to conserve by the Nature Conservatory. So I would applaud you. I know you have a job to do and I thank you for it, but I really believe that this measure needs to go before the people um, because a lot of studies need to be done. And I agree with uh, Mary, we have a lot of empty industrial spaces that have been and sitting uh, empty um, along uh, by the airport and in the industrial place there on Technology Parkway. So I would urge you to please consider this and put it on the ballot. I thank you for your time. And uh, also, I would like you to consider that there will be a lot of toxic chemicals that uh, will be addressed and they're all of air quality and water quality. So remember, what goes up must come down. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, speaker. Donna, if you could please state your name. Hi, my name is Donna Haynes and I am a resident and a business owner of San Benito County. This is my first time to speak at a Board of Supervisors meeting and I appreciate the opportunity to provide my statement to you. I was made aware of the Strata Verde project a little over a year ago through various committees that I'm involved in. I also had the, op the pleasure of speaking directly to some of the key stakeholders of this project. I truly believe that this is the project that we need in our county if we want tremendous opportunities for our existing and future generations. I also believe that there's been a lot of misleading information from the opponents of this project. The bi biggest of these is that they will be able to skirt the requirements of CEQA and or the ERI, EIR reports. What the opponents do know and are either misleading the public or they are not telling you is that during this initiative process, these reports are not required by law. However, if this initiative is approved by the voters, then the project is required by law to submit these environmental reports and Strata Verde has acknowledged such in their initiative. One of the most expressed needs for our community has been the availability of jobs. But this is not just jobs that we're talking about. We're talking about careers for our future generations. Careers that will give them the ability to further their education, buy a home, support a family, and be a role model to future generations. Strata Verde Project will offer our citizens and our young people those opportunities. The interaction with the schools and the colleges will provide information to students and spark interest into careers that some had never even thought to explore. Most of these careers have only been available to those people in much larger cities. 
Strata Verde project is an opportunity to increase the quality of life for many of the residents of San Benito County. And I ask the Board of Supervisors to adopt a resolution to submit the initiative measure without alteration to the voters at the next regularly scheduled station, statewide election. Finally, um, I would like to say thank you, Jim, for your service to my district as my city councilman and as my supervisor. Both Steve and I wish you and your family and your business the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mia, if you could Next. please state your name. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, <laughs> this is Mia Casey. I'm a resident of Hollister and co-founder of San Benito Citizens for a Brighter Future. Our group is excited about the vast potential of this project. It's not only going to bring 5,000 new jobs and over 12 million a year in revenue for our county, but it will also stabilize our economy here. There's also going to be new ancillary businesses that will spring up to service this industry. And I'm particularly liking the concept of a Gavilan College partnership with training and internship opportunities for students. You know, we're dependent on agriculture and agritourism here in San Benito County. But when a county is limited to one or two types of industry, if one of those industries falters, it can mean big trouble financially. Diversification is key to economic stability. And Strata Verde will bring a new cutting edge industry to San Benito. As their representative said, there are a lot of misconceptions floating around. I've heard people harping about the fact that twice before Newport Land brought proposals for this property that included a lot of housing. Well, our supervisors here have turned them down flat because it's not a good location for housing. There's absolutely no housing in Strata Verde. Despite claims being made that there, there is a problem with CEQA, as you heard, there's going to be a full CEQA environmental review and all the other studies and reports will have to be completed as well. I know that there are questions that need answers, but Strata Verde has demonstrated a willingness to adapt to the needs of San Benito County by keeping traffic off Highway 25 and creating the main entrance out at Highway 101. They've also preserved over 500 acres for farming and 200 acres along the river for a park and river walk that will be open to the public. You know, it's not helpful to spread doom and gloom. Let's give this project a chance. Strata Verde is doing the whole initiative process that Pork has been clamoring for, taking it directly to the people for a vote. So I agree, let's let the process take its course and go to residents so they can decide and vote on it in November. But I would like to see people stop trying to shoot it down out of the gate with misrepresentations. It seems dishonest to say, let the people decide and then attempt to sway the outcome with fear mongering and misleading information. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker card. Wayne, if you could please state your name. Uh, my name is uh, Wayne Norton. I'm a resident of the county. And I'm excited that this is going to, uh, the Strata Verde uh, project is going to go to the voters because it's, it's one that offers a, a lot of potential for our residents. The potential for good paying local jobs to get uh, our local citizens off of the, the commute. What, something like 70% of our, our residents commute out of the county for work. Wouldn't it be great to have some good paying local jobs right here in our county? And yes, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered, and that's why I'm glad it's going through the ballot process, and we'll have a chance to debate all of those issues. The impact of TriCal, the impact of all of the, the various um, questions that people have about environmental concerns, those are important and they need to be answered. But I'm also very uh, excited about the possibility for our local school district. Remember, this project is in the Aroma San Juan School District, which is a pretty crap cash strapped district at the moment. And the opportunity to have an increase in uh, sales tax coming from, or sorry, from property tax, uh, coming from the increased property values with no students being added to the school district because there's no housing in this project. Uh, it could be a terrific windfall for our district. I'm glad that the board is, uh, it, is gonna put it on the ballot. And I look forward to having a robust discussion about the project's merits. Thank you. Next speaker. Lou, if you could please state your name. Uh, 
Hi, Lou Shermande. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about the bypassing of uh, the normal EIR process for a project like this. I wanted to speak from a background in cultural resource management of contract archaeology. Aside from uh, the natural environment, normally a large project like this, its EIR would include uh, surface surveys and ethnographic studies of the area. Uh, because a lot of this land has been agricultural in the past and hasn't required permits, uh, we really don't have a good understanding of what cultural heritage, such as indigenous sites, burial sites, sacred sites that might, might exist in the area. And uh, I want the board to be aware of the fact that uh, making a decision on this without uh, an EIR for the project-wide area having taken place will not put any, any of that uh, in, uh, information forward. So um, I would uh, certainly be in support of uh, pushing this uh, to November at the very least uh, for a general vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker card. Irma, if you could please state your name. Good morning, Sharon Board of Supervisors. My name is Irma Gonzalez. As many of you know, I've been a resident of our county my entire life. The Strada Verde project is one of the very few that is a revenue generating project that would help bring additional funding for our county schools and to our community college with little or no financial impact. In addition, this project will help support the general government and infrastructure needs of San Miguel County as well. I'd like to encourage you to support the Strada Verde project and adopt the resolution to submit the initiative measure to the voters for the November 3rd election. And on another note, Supervisor Gilio, your news brings me great sadness. I've always been impressed with your thoughtfulness, your intellect, and your critical thinking and reasoning skills. I wish you luck, sir, to you and your family. You will be missed. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Next speaker. Kevin, if you could please state your name. Kevin Stopper, District 4. Uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for letting me speak. Uh, I just wanted to speak in support of this Strata Verde project coming up in the North County area. I believe it's a long overdue boost for our county, bringing in tax, tax dollars and economic development that would otherwise be taken advantage by neighboring cities or counties. I believe its location and plan for environmental cleanup of the river, et cetera, is a great plan. <clears throat> this to get this county going again on the right track. San Benito as much as well, as much as we want to disbelieve it has gone stagnant. We need police, sheriff, we need firefighting and med medical elements to be seriously updated. We also know we need infrastructure needs to be updated. <clears throat> I believe this project along with the Beta Bell 101 project would be a shot in the arm to get that infrastructure going again along with our measure g funding for the roads i don't think opposing special interest groups and we know who that is to be deciding what and how our county needs to grow i'm perfectly happy with letting our own people decide that for themselves through a vote because i believe we have the backing from the public we're constantly hearing on social media i want this i want that from the majority of the folks in the area we hear about how we don't want to drive to Salinas or Gilroy for this or that. Well, this will, if this continue, this will continue if we stay stagnant as we are. We control, we can control what we want within our county as a people, and make our own decisions and not let the broad decisions of one single certain group that wants to essentially shut us down for another 20 years. I also want to personally thank. Supervisor Jim Gillio for his service to my own district four in the city of Hollister and the county of San Benito. You'll sorely be missed for your extremely hard work and dedication, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So today I just clocked in. I said I was here at noon because I got here a little bit. Can you state your name for the record? I'll just say name. And then we'll just say that you work till five because you're going to. Uh, Tomorrow, a couple hours. Well, you're going to go home and you're going to go some. Oh. Okay. What are we listening to right now? Conversation. Yeah. Um, we have no more comments. If you want to make a comment, press star nine or raise your hand.
We have no more comments. Well, we got one more. Oh. One more shot, we have one in the chamber, Mr. Chair, Ms. Salinas. Yes, please. Okay, thank you for speaking. Um, just so that the public knows, Fukushima was a nuclear plant that had a meltdown that was created by an earthquake that was followed by a tsunami. Has nothing to do close to this project, and I can't believe that it was compared to this project. Um, the public, if, if you're not aware, California has the most stringent, stringent environmental laws. Nothing gets done by this committee or by the supervisors where the laws are broken. They hold, like, they hold each other accountable, and I find it quite upsetting, and it's actually in, it's, it's insulting to, to, to them that there are, there's a public out there, a portion of the public going out there and saying that the supervisors are on the take, are doing illegal things, are doing backdoor deals. It is just insulting, and I, and I wish that the opponents of this um, project would just stop and just go with the truth. And the fact of the matter is that it's, it's based because of pork, and they came up with this initiative that was actually going to stop any type of project for the next almost 30 years, which is insane. We're a poor county. We don't have the monies that other counties have. And now in this economic situation that we find ourselves in, based on the COVID-19, which was beyond our control, we're going, we're, it's gonna take a while for us to recover. So this, this project would give it a boost. I'm going to read something from uh, Chris Hollins that she was not available today. Anyway, she pushes for the board of members to push this project through. This is a great project that has proven time and time again to have been thoroughly evaluated and to bring much needed jobs and revenue for our struggling economy, econ community desperately needs. Our poor community has been preyed upon and continuously lose, seems to lose out to pork, who lies and misleads people using fear and traffic and growth. Take, but take the Better Bell Project as an example. Had no zero idea what the people were voting for, and it was for zoning. And people, we put the word out there that it was for zoning, and they made it into something completely different, which is why the measure, they won that side of the measure. Just so that we know, um, the public knows, and if you're not aware of, the, uh, there is already designs and money sets aside from Santa Clara County, the state of California, and San Benito County for 25, the intersection of 25 and the overpass and 101. So that's already in the works and the plan. So this brings forth even more why we should accept this these type of projects. And Honestly, it shouldn't even be going to a measure. The only reason it was going to a measure is because there was a countermeasure about trying to build something for the next 30 years. This project should move forward, but if this what needs to happen, it happens, but it sets the wrong precedence for the next projects. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. So that concludes the public comment section? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, we'll bring it back to the so my understanding, Barbara, correct me if I'm wrong here, we only have two options. One option is to have this or to place it to the next uh, statewide election. Is that correct, Barbara? Yes. Okay. What's the plan for the board? I'd like to make a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Yes. Go ahead, Anthony. If it say something uh, first, it's in my district and um, I appreciate a, a, a moment. I'm, I won't take long. It's been a long day for all of us today. And uh, I want to thank the speakers uh, on both sides of the issue. They brought up some very good valid points. Uh, and and I'm looking forward to the election where this thing is to be completely vetted out. And, and hopefully it's to be vetted out in an honest, direct way. Um, we've been on the board for about 16 years, Jaime. And uh, we, we've seen some development pressure in that general area. That ranch is really not a very good uh, agricultural value area. Um, and in our general plan in 2015, uh, it was identified as a uh, community study area, if you recall. I particularly didn't care for that designation. Um, simply because 
uh, I remembered Rancho San Benito. I was very much opposed to Rancho San Benito, uh, thinking that it's just a bedroom community for Santa Clara and, uh, and a source for housing for the jobs north. Now, we have an opportunity. This county has a real opportunity to have some jobs here. And what that generates is a tremendous amount of revenue um, for the county. Uh, we've had conversations about maybe a new library. Some people feel that our 60-year-old uh, library is uh, a little bit outdated and needs to be bigger, needs to be more modern. Now we can have that conversation if it's something like this comes in. The county has acquired quite a bit of uh, land for a regional park. I, and I, I think that would be fantastic if we had the revenue to do it. Um, right now, the reality is, can't do it. Um, my, and instead, our citizens, maybe some of us on the board, uh, go out of county, go uh, for a bike ride and enjoy other counties' uh, regional parks. Our citizens deserve better. They deserve the j good paying jobs here and uh, and a higher quality of life. And I, I think this is to be the catalyst that's to uh, move us forward in, in this next, uh, in, in the next decade. And so um, I'm hoping that they're, they'll be successful I have all the confidence in the in the voters on on this issue, and uh, it's in the right area. And you know, I look forward to putting this on the ballot myself. Thank you, Supervisor Patel. Supervisor Jim Gilliam. putting this uh, on the ballot and I think uh, Supervisor Botello is prepared to make a motion. Thank you. Yes, if, if we can, uh, one second, let me go to my computer so I could uh, read it. I was in a more comfortable chair. <laughs> Supervisor Botello, also when you make that motion to make sure that you include um, as amended as far as the resolution, because I did make that amendment earlier regarding that language of the measure. Actually, uh, you want to hold off on that, Anthony? I have uh, both okay. Fernandez and Spice Medina if they wish to comment. Go ahead. Medina? No, I'll give the motion to uh, Anthony. I was just going to make a motion, but we'll give it to Anthony. Let him make the motion. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I was thinking the same way. Supervisor Hernandez? Chair. No. Who said that they? Okay. Supervisor Patello, we can make a motion. Okay. Um, we're going to adopt the uh, initiative measure without without alterations or with alterations. With alterations. So uh, you're, you're adopting the resolution calling for the election. With the change yes. noted in the ballot measure to move the words be adopted to the end of the question. That's my motion. Is there a second? Medina, second. Thank you. Motion by Supervisor Patello, second by Supervisor Medina. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Motion carries. It shall be on the November election. Thank you. Okay, the vote was 5 0 on that. Um, Five zero, and that's the last regular one before we go. Hey, Barbara, I got a quick question. Can we hold off number thirty-six to the next meeting? No, we have to talk about it today. Um, I think you can hold it off to the next. All we're doing is introducing it, yeah. waiving first reading, so it's very brief. It brief. is brief. We could do it in five minutes or less. Okay, go ahead. Go for it. Okay, uh, this is just a, a ordinance. I'm going to read the title of the ordinance for the record. It's an ordinance of the Board of Supervisors of the County of San Benito amending administrative citation provisions of the San Benito County Code Chapter 1.04 sections 1.04.001, 1.04.003 and 1.04.005. And the main change is this is to enhance our cannabis um, enforcement. It allows the issuance of an administrative citation immediately and doesn't require a waiting period and an opportunity to cure, um, and it modifies in a minor way uh, the administrative citation amounts. 
um, and make some other minor changes. It's uh, um, pretty straightforward and I will submit it to the board. We're asking that you accept introduction, weigh further reading and continue it to the next agenda for adoption. Okay, thank you. Any questions to the board before I go to public comments? No. None? Okay. Any cards? Make your last motion, Julio. Any, any public comment? Yeah. Okay, no, I, I, Mr. Um, Chair, I don't think we have any comments. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Your last motion. We'll bring it. We'll bring it back to the board. I'm. Should I what? raise? What? I'm sorry. It might make the what, conversation. What's the? Uh, just real quick. What's what's the amount in the ordinance? I believe it's uh, maximum oh, one thousand three hundred dollars for the. Like, and, and that was the only um, other question. Uh, you know, if the board had wanted to raise the citation amount to a higher dollar figure for um, citations, but. Um, yes, I wanted to uh, raise it to uh, ten thousand per citation. I, I can agree with that. How much? So you said 10,000, sir. How much, Mark? 10,000? Okay, thank you. Is there any objections to that? I think that okay. with, with uh, the board's permission or um, direction, if we could introduce the ordinance today and continue to the next meeting, um, I think that I will bring back a, a more clear language about amending that citation amount to, to the 10,000 10, 10, so it's correctly Perfect. written. Okay. Who wishes to make a motion? Jim's going to make his last motion. Sure. Do we need to read the title and ordinance for the record, Barbara? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, I move to introduce and waive the first reading of the ordinance amending code enforcement administrative citations provisions to San Diego County uh, code chapter 1.04 and continue the matter for adoption at the next Board of Supervisors meeting on August 4th, 2020. It's our second. Second. Motion by Gilio, second by Hernandez. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? <laughs> Motion Thank to you. adjourn, Mr. Five Chair. No, 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 no. I'll take it. Never mind. I, I don't think I we got two like more items. Either. We have at least, least two more items. No. I thought so too. I already made the motion. Do we have anything? Okay. Hey, Barbara, do you have anything in full session? I'm sorry. What was the vote on that item? 5-0. 5, -0. Zero. Five, -0. Okay. Five -zero. Um, I know that I think I saw Reed back there. If we could have him come forward or the yeah. clerk recorder, um, there might be an urgency item that the board could consider today. Um, Reed, uh, maybe you could give a brief presentation and then the board can consider whether or not to add as an urgency item calling for an election to fill the position of district four supervisor it's adopting a resolution the reason to do that is so we don't have to call a special meeting at the end of this week it allows um okay. publication that's fair <laughs> is there a motion so the uh, findings for an urgency order is that the agenda came to the attention of the agency after the posting of the agenda and it cannot reasonably wait until the next um meeting which is correct because if we don't hear it today's date we'd have to have a special meeting this week to probably meet the deadlines that we need to have that makes sense for the november election for the november election to fill my seat yes correct um do we need to have public comment uh or supervisor comment yeah add it yeah uh, i think you can add it as the agenda. To, add it on to add it on yeah you need to, to add it are on are you good yeah. okay with adding it on voting it okay and should we do public comment and then or do we need to do public comment yeah. and adding it on or not? i don't know I've no got, we're, we're gonna first vote yeah i think we can just add it on okay i i you need a motion to add it uh yes yes gilio moves to add this on to the uh agenda as an urgency ordinance as an urgency agenda item. i'm sorry is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Again, okay, motion. It passes. Now, um, okay. do we need to make a presentation, Barbara? Do we go straight to public comment? So, actually, let's. Um, I think that there's a work in progress here, um, and we may not actually. I'll have Reed uh, come up. So, my understanding from some of the emails that have been flying today is that we should publish it this Friday so that it's in the paper for next week. The period of nomination being open would be August 1st to August 7th. 
And I think that uh, some samples of resolutions calling for the election were sent to read, but I don't know whether it's been finalized yet. We may go into closed session and allow you to print some resolutions out, but I wanted to add it to the agenda before we adjourned into closed session. How close are we to having a resolution that the board could approve? I, I literally just sent you and uh, the, uh, Joe Paul Gonzalez a copy of a draft resolution to that effect. Okay. Maybe um, if you could send it to uh, Lorena, maybe, or um, Dulce, or, or Edgar, yeah, and we could print it out and uh, review it. Um, would you like to adjourn into closed session first and then come back out and do the open session item, or would you prefer to do the open session item and then go into closed session? Let's just do the open session and then we'll go to closed session. Okay, let's go get a copy of that resolution. So you're printing, you're sending it to Lorena? Okay, thank you. Can we get a quick break then? Yeah, it's a quick break. Oh. The recess. Oh, you know what? In that case, yeah, let's take a quick break. Five minutes. Oh.
Ready, Mr. Chair. Okay, we're ready. Yes, sir. Mike, Barbara. Director, Supervisor Gilliard announced that he was resigning from position of supervisor effective July 31st. I've presented um, a resolution to the board calling for the election of uh, supervisor to be placed on the d November 3rd, 2020 uh, statewide general election. Um, Thank you, sir. That means that the nomination period would be open uh, from, I believe, November, I'm sorry, August 1st to August 7th. Another one? Um, and the board is asked to adopt this resolution today, which would place this um, election on the uh, 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 for the November third election. Okay. Should we hear public comment first? Yes. Public comment. Okay. Let's go. To public comments. If you wish to make a comment, press star nine or raise your hand. We do not have any comments. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll bring the, the board. Among the board. Ms. Salinas, go right ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, so I guess my comment is that I was really taken by surprise, and you guys know that I'm very not good for, I'm <laughs> never short for words. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank um, Jim Gillio for the time that he's given to this community. It's been very well, has been very, he's been, he's served very well. He is, comes up here and he's, he does his homework. He's available to the citizens out there in the entire community, not just those in his district. He's very open, open-doored, and uh, comes prepared, does more than, his, more than his share. He knows numbers, and he reads the numbers, and he comes back, and he questions when he's got issues with the numbers, and we're gonna, we're gonna miss somebody like that. Uh, not to say that the other supervisors aren't that way. Well, some of them are, and some of them aren't. Um, but he's very special, and I'm sorry to see that he's go going to leave um, the, uh, the dais. I was sorry to see him leave the city of Hollister when he left because he did a great job, same thing, in the city of Hollister. And I completely understand that I know that this was a very hard decision for him to make and it's a decision based between he and his family. And anything else is literally none of our business and we shouldn't go after him and asking him any questions, just accept the fact that he's made a decision, a hard decision, and we can go forward. And uh, like again, I'm, I'm sorry to see him go. Um, but we, we need to move forward and y'all are gonna make a decision on um, what the next steps are. And it'll be someone, it's gonna be hard to fill his shoes, but we need to, we need to get some work going because it's gonna happen really quickly and hopefully um, we have a great candidate out there that's gonna come on board and take over where Jim's leaving off. Thank you. Thank you, Elio, it was kind of you. Next speaker. We have no more comments. No more comments. No more comments, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. We'll go back to the board now. Uh, comments, uh, Supervisor Medina? None. Yeah, Supervisor Batello? Um, what, what do you want me to do, make a motion? Uh, if you have any comments. No, I don't have any comments other than I would talk to Jim later. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez? No comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, what's the pleasure of the board? Hang on, Robert. You want to give some comments? Huh? You ready for a motion? Do you want to give comments? Or... No. Uh, yes, if anybody wants to make a motion, please. Um, is it appropriate for me to make this motion? Or not? Okay. Yes, uh, uh, I, I move that we adopt the resolution of the San Miguel County Board of Supervisors setting an election for a supervisor of District 4 on the November 3rd, 2020 statewide general election. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Motion carries five zero. 
Thank you. Thank you for your service, uh, Jim. Now, now we go to closed session. Yes.
I don't have to go to the other number, do I? We're done. We're done. Yeah. Oh, we're done, Supervisor. Have a good day. Okay, good. Have a good one. Thank you.